And our next speaker is Malena Sangvile, and she's going to talk about common acoustic phonon lifetimes in inorganic and hybrid lead halide proskites. Thank you. So good afternoon. Um, first, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to uh, give this talk. So I'm going to talk about uh, phonon lifetimes in um, lead uh, halide perovskites. And um, so this class of materials have attracted a lot of attention lately, um, uh, mostly because they exhibit exceptional properties, structural properties, optical and electronic properties for optoelectronics applications such as um, solar cells, LEDs, photodetectors, or lasers. So um, they have been um, introduced in the previous talk. So I'm going to talk about the non-magnetic variants of these materials. And they can be cat categorized into two groups um, according, well, whether the A site is inorganic, uh, I'm going to consider cesium, for example, or um, whether the A site is a molecule such as metal ammonium. But in either case, uh, we can see the structure as uh, having um, a lead site in an octahedral environment formed by the halogen atoms, and uh, they all together form a framework around the A site. And for the organic-inorganic variant, um, the molecule is coupled to the framework uh, through hydrogen uh, bonds. So a lot of um, theoretical and experimental works have been uh, devoted to the study of these hybrid materials, mostly because they um, are potentially uh, efficient photovoltaic materials. And a key feature is that uh, the molecule develops its own dynamic, and all of these materials with different halides um, all show an order disorder transition of the molecule at some temperature. And above this temperature, this molecule remains disordered. So it has been suggested that um, the presence of the molecule may be key in the enhanced uh, solar power conversion uh, properties. So we have investigated the low energy uh, dynamics, lattice dynamics in methyl ammonium chloride previously. And we have shown that uh, the disorder of the molecule at, at um, room temperature is responsible for a, a strong uh, shortening of the phonon, acoustic phonon lifetime. And this has been supported by um, other a similar study on the iodine compound. And because um, the, phonon the transverse acoustic phonon lifetime is directly linked to the thermal properties, it has been suggested that the molecule may be at the origin of an ultra-low thermal conductivity that was found in this system. But more recently, it has also been shown that uh, the all inorganic compounds also show similar properties, and especially for cesium lead bromide, where a, an ultra-low thermal conductivity was also um, measured. And it has been shown that it also displays similar photovoltaic performances. So an open question is uh, whether the molecular, um, the molecular nature of the A site is essential for these uh, photoelectronic properties. And with that in mind, we have studied the low energy transverse acoustic phonons in cesium lead bromide in order to, de to um, determine which feature in the lattice dynamics is unique to uh, the hybrid perovskites. So we measured the low energy lattice dynamics using inelastic neutron scattering um, for a neutron scattering experiment. It's constrained by the laws of um, uh, momentum and energy conservation, and it allows to map out the excitations in the Brewing zone so we performed inelastic neutron scattering at NIST and at the ILL. We have measured um, a low, um, a transverse acoustic phonon along this line from GABA to X, which I will call TA1, and um, another mode uh, from the gamma to, from gamma to M, which I will call TA2. 
We also measured some specific measurements at uh, the three high symmetry points, M, X, and R. And we have um, completed these measurements with powder diffraction um, measurements at, the, uh, at, the, at NIST and at the ESRF. Um, so the study of the inorganic lead halide perovskite has started in the 70s with the first structural characterization using elastic neutron scattering. And um, they showed that uh, cesium lead bromide undergoes a cubic to tetragonal uh, transition, which is first order. And it, it's also associated to superlattice reflection uh, appearing at the end point. And then below 360K, it goes from a tetragonal to an orthorhombic uh, symmetry, which is second order transition. And it's associated to superlattice bright peaks at the X and R point. So I show here the, um, the, me the, the results for the TA1 mode um, in cesium lead bromide in the cubic and orthorhombic um, phase. And I show in comparison the data that we previously obtained in methyl ammonium lead chloride in gray. So these are constant Q scans that we performed in the brim wind zone from gamma to X as function of momentum. And by extracting the energy position of these uh, peaks, we can get the dispersion. So um, the slope of this dispersion at low Q is related to the, con the elastic constant C44, and I uh, compare the, the, the values with other chloride um, samples, both inorganic and organic, and we can see that the dispersion is cesium lead bromide is softer, which we can att attribute to a bigger size of the framework due to a bigger radius of bromine. We can also uh, extract from this the phonon line width as a function of uh, Q, that I show here. And um, what we can see is that there's a significant broadening of the phonon line width towards the, the zone boundary. So the phonon line width is proportional to the inverse of the phonon lifetime. So we can see that there's a phonon lifetime shortening at the zone boundary. And the Q dependence is quite similar to the case of the uh, hybrid compound. So these are the results for the TA2 mode. We did this, uh, similar measurements, and we can see that the broadening of the phonon line width is even more dramatic when going uh, towards the end point. Um, and we can see also that uh, close to the zone boundary, this broadening is quite similar to um, the case of uh, methyl ammonium chloride. So this burning was attributed to the disorder of the molecule in the hybrid compound. But here we can see that it's similar in cesium lead bromide. So it shows that the presence of the molecule is not essential to see the same features in cesium lead bromide. So to understand what causes this uh, behavior at the zone boundary, we investigated the, neutron, uh, the, the temperature dependence of the thermal parameters for uh, the bromine and the cesium um, ions <coughs> using neutron powder diffraction at NIST and X-ray diffraction at the synchrotron ESRF. So what I show here is the temperature dependence of the three components in space, B11, B22, and B33, of the thermal parameters for the bromine and the cesium ions. And these are, uh, the, this is an illustration of these uh, thermal parameters in real space. So the blue ellipsoid corresponds to um, the cesium displacement, and the brown ellipsoid corresponds to the uh, bromine displacement. So what we can see is that in the cubic and tetragonal phases, um, the bromine disperse, uh, displacements are quite, quite large and anisotropic. And then when we go towards the orthorhombic phase, the cesium becomes very um, uh, anisotropic too, and large. So we can see it better on, with this ellipsoid. And the second interesting feature is that the orientation and the shape of the cesium displacements seem to follow the octahedral tilting 
that are involved in the phase transitions. So it, this suggests that there's a, the, a coupling between the cesium displacement and the tilt distortions in this compound. And we can also understand that these large anisotropic displacements of the cesium um, may be at the origin of the phonon dumping in cesium lead bromides, um, exactly as in the hybrid uh, compounds. We also investigated the relaxational behavior at the zone boundaries. So these are um, cuts in energy around E equals zero at the X point and M point as function of temperature. And what we saw is just a uh, sudden a large increase of the intensity uh, when going to the orthorhombic phase, while the energy width remains resolution limited um, on the terahertz scale. However, when we look at the R point, we can see critical scattering beyond the instrumental resolution above the tetragonal and, um, and orthorhombic uh, transitions. So we can see that uh, if we strike the line width, the energy line width as function of temperature, it follows uh, first a first, uh, fir first jump at the tetragonal transition, and then it decreases further to reach the Bragg resolution. And this is also con concomitant with um, critical scattering in function of momentum, as we can see on these elastic scans. And we can see a narrowing of uh, this critical scattering, which uh, goes along a divergence of the correlation legs as function of temperature. So the, in relation to neutron scattering structure factors, the R point corresponds to um, displacive distortions and cesium displacements. So what we understand is that um, the cesium displacement that we could see in powder diffraction may explain this uh, critical behavior. So what we have is uh, that we have critical uh, cesium fluctuations that might uh, affect the lattice, um, the lattice dynamics. <clears throat> so in conclusion, um, if we compare both um, hybrid and oligo in, in organic perovskite, we saw that there's a strong phonon lifetime shortening at the zone boundary, which are caused by uh, fluctuation of the A site. And um, there's, um, there's, uh, the, they, it, it shows also that there's a, a strong coupling between this, the A site uh, fluctuations and the, um, the, frame, the framework. What we also show is that the influence, the influence of the A site on the lattice dynamics seems inherent to all of the perovskite, um, either hybrid or all inorganic, and that may explain the universal ultra low um, thermal conductivity that was found in both types of materials. However, there's one difference that lies in the lack of uh, critical fluctuations at the zone boundary that we didn't see in the uh, hybrid compounds. And this may indicate that in cesium lead bromide, the transitions may be dominated by um, a coupling to a relaxational dynamics rather than displacive. So I would like to, um, to thank all of the collaborators on this project. Um, I would like to mention that we have also uh, further studied the, the coupling between the molecular and the, the framework dynamics in methanominium lead chloride, and this will be presented in uh, the poster number 22, and I thank you for your attention. Thanks. So open the floor up to questions. So I got the first one then. Um, so you did this study for the bromine compound. How do you expect the damping to change as you replace it with chlorine or iodine? Um, so the chlorine one was studied a uh, long time ago, um, I think by I think Roger Carley was involved in also again Sharani. Um, they also saw a strong damping of the acoustic phonons at the MNR points. Yes. Any other questions? 
Okay, we'll thank the speaker. Thank you very much. And next up, it's Beth Naradnik, and she is talking about couples, structural distortions, domains, and control of phase competition in polar uh, samarium barium manganese oxide. All right, thank you for the introduction. So um, my focus today is going to be on um, um, understanding and controlling the um, crystal structure of this, um, pol oops, of this polar rare earth um, manganite. Um, so this um, work that I'll be talking about recently appeared in this um, PRB paper, and I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators on this work, um, Jin Gong He, who's currently at Northwestern, and Craig Feeney at Cornell University. Um, so the rare earth um, manganites have been studied extensively in the context of the um, colossal magnetoresistance effect. Um, today I'm going to be focusing on an A-site ordered variant. Um, where due to the large size mismatch of the rare earth and barium cations, they can be synthesized um, in this um, layered form. Um, this is what the uh, um, electronic and magnetic phase diagram looks like. As you vary the rare earth ionic radius, you go from a charge and orbitally ordered CE type antiferromagnetic insulating phase. Um, I'm showing this over here where it involves these um, ferromagnetic spin zig zigzags. Um, and then as you increase the rare earth ionic radius, you go to A-type antiferromagnet or ferromagnetic um, metals. Um, so right now I'm going to focus in specifically on this um, samarium barium manganese oxide compound, which in addition to being a charge and orbitally ordered um, CE um, antiferromagnetic insulator, um, also was shown in a number of um, experiments a few years ago. Um, has a polar um, crystal structure which enables additional functionality. You can also think about interesting couplings between the polarization and these other um, degrees of freedom. So there's been a lot of study of the rare earth manganites, especially their um, electronic and magnetic degrees of freedom, but there's been less work on their um, crystal structures, which are also very complex. So this um, structural aspect will be what I'll focus on today. Um, so the outline for the rest of the talk is I'm going to um, first look at the um, ground state crystal structure and show you how some um, nonlinear couplings between the structural distortions are key for actually stabilizing this structure. Um, then I'll look at the domains and the domain walls. And then at the end, I'll um, look at how we can use this understanding to think about stabling some of the competing um, electronic and magnetic phases in this compound. So before I get to that, um, one slide on our um, theoretical um, approach. So I'll be um, combining group theoretic analysis with um, DFT plus U calculations as implemented in VASP. Um, for all the calculations here, I've set um, U to 4 um, and J to 1.2 EV. Um, I selected these um, values so that co the computed ground state um, reproduces the experimentally reported um, magnetic and crystal structures as you go across the um, phase diagram um, varying the rare earth um, ion. All right, so the ground state structure of samarium barium manganite, it crystallizes in this polar P21AM phase. Um, and we can um, decompose this distorted structure into a high symmetry reference structure P with the symmetry P4 slash MMM and four symmetry distinct um, structural distortions. Um, so these symmetries here are labeled by these um, irreducible representations of P4 slash MMM. So these um, distortions are an out of phase um, octahedral rotation distortion, um, a uh, breathing distortion, distortion, which couples to the manganese three plus manganese four plus charge order um, in this um, compound, um, a low symmetry um, distortion that transforms like sigma two that um, encompasses um, uh, uh, displacements of the um, atoms in a stripe-like pattern, and then finally a um, polar distortion. So we can assess the um, contributions of these different distortions to the ground state 
um, by looking at their, um, the amplitudes from decomposing the structure. Um, we can do this both for an experimentally reported structure and also a structure relaxed with DFT. Um, and the key thing is we find that most of the distortion amplitude comes from the octahedral rotation and from this low symmetry um, stripe distortion. So we can learn some more about this um, ground state structure by next um, looking at um, energy surfaces. So what this is is we start with a high symmetry structure over here on the left and then freeze in um, each of these four um, structural distortions and separate calculations. One here is the amplitude of the distortion that occurs in the DFT um, relaxed ground state. And what we find is kind of interesting because we see that the octahedral rotation distortion um, lowers the energy, but um, the um, breathing and polar modes both um, increase the energy as they're frozen and they're stable. And in addition, this um, stripe distortion very slightly decreases energy and then also becomes um, stable. So this seems kind of curious because all four distortions um, occur in the ground state, yet only one of them seems to be really um, unstable here. So what's going on? Um, so we can um, understand this by looking at um, uh, coupling terms um, in the um, free energy between these um, structural distortions. So here I'm showing um, some third order coupling terms in the Landau expansion of the free energy. Um, first, there is a coupling between the breathing distortion and this stripe distortion. So here um, in the stripe distortion, you can have different um, amplitudes of displacements on two different um, sublattices um, indicated by these black and white arrows. That's the meaning of this S1 and S2. Um, there's also a coupling between the octahedral rotation and the stripe distortion. And then finally, there's a trilinear coupling between the rotation, the breathing mode, and the polar mode. So we can look at the effect of these couplings on the energetics by then going back to our energy surface and starting here where we have one of the um, distortion amplitudes fixed, we can then freeze in a second one and that resulting energy surface will show us the impact of that um, coupling term um, on the energy. So for example, um, here this blue one, we've fixed the octahedral rotation, we're freezing in the stripe distortion. You can see it's lowering the energy. Um, up here, we've this black highlighted one, we've fixed the um, stripe distortion, freeze in the breathing distortion. We see there's a strong lowering of energy. Um, and finally, we can keep going with this. And um, over here on this final panel, we have we perform calculations where two distortions are fixed and we freeze in the final one. This brings us to the um, uh, ground state um, energy. And so the key thing is we can notice that you know, these coupling terms between the distortions play a very important role in stabilizing the ground state. Um, I'm not showing the polar distortion on this plot, but um, performing similar um, energy surface calculations with the polar distortion, um, we find that um, it is induced via these coupling terms um, by a hybrid and proper-like mechanism. So um, a reason to be interested in these um, uh, coupling terms also is they, um, these distortions coupled to the electronic and magnetic degrees of freedom, so these can give us some sort of interesting insights into those states as well. So for example, um, we've found that the, um, you know, the breathing mode um, couples to this, um, which couples to the electronic charge order, um, occurs together with this you know, large amplitude set of um, stripe displacements. Um, and so this is, um, while we still need to understand kind of some of the microscopic mechanisms of this, um, this is quite a different picture of um, uh, char the charge order state than is often discussed in the literature of charge orders, which is the models typically focus just on um, electronic degrees of freedom and electronic instabilities. Um, and interestingly, there's some recent work from um, Lena Krukuditz's group at um, Cornell. Um, they did some electron microscopy on a different um, manganite, but they saw in the charge order phase actually um, a set of um, stripe displacements. All right, so now let's um, zoom out a little bit and um, look at the um, domain structure and these couplings that I've talked about in the first part of the talk will be key for determining that structure as well. Um, so I'll particularly be focusing mainly on the structural domains here, although there's also electronic and magnetic um, domains in this system. Um, so first of all, um, for the structural domains, there's orthorhombic twins. Um, and these, um, we can label them by different um, uh, orientations of the um, stripe order parameter. So this order parameter is actually a four-dimensional quantity. 
I'm an orthorhombic twin one. The first two components here are non-zero. So we were only dealing with two components in the first part of the talk because we were just talking about one twin domain. And then an orthorhombic twin two, the second two components are zero. So over here on the um, left, we have the stripes are going vertically. Over here on the right, they're going um, horizontally. Now, if we focus in on one orthorhombic twin domain, we can look at what are the structural domains that actually recur within that twin domain. Um, so now we just need to deal with this two-dimensional part, S1 and S2, the stripe displacements on the two sublattices. So we can um, draw this um, order parameter, uh, represent the order parameter in this two-dimensional space, and represent the domain as a point in this um, space. So just the um, uh, labeled by the um, A and B, the amplitudes of the displacements on the two sublattices. So this is one domain. Um, so in fact, there is. Um, eight structural domains um, here, um, corresponding to different orientational um, variants. And then by using the um, coupling term, once we've chosen for a given domain the um, direction of the stripe order parameter, the coupling um, terms will determine um, what is going on with the other order parameters there. So for example, um, this coupling between the octahedral rotation and the stripe distortion tells us that the domains in each quadrant have the same sense of the octahedral rotation. Um, this coupling between the breathing mode and the stripe distortion tells us that the domains in these um, light pink and blue quadrants have opposite phases of the breathing and charge ordering. And then finally, this um, trilinear coupling um, tells us that the domains in the hatched and solid regions have opposite polarization. So this plot sort of um, efficiently summarizes this set of um, coupled structural um, domains here. So now let's look at the um, domain walls. So within this order parameter um, space approach, um, the, a domain wall is represented as a um, path between the two domain between two domains. Um, so here's an example of one um, here. And so I'm going to um, to get some insight into these domain walls. I'm going to look at um, sort of what's equivalent to an intrinsic ferroelectric switching path. So I'll look at, you know, how does the structure of the energy surface evolve as we um, go from here to here? So you know, with this approach, we won't get um, you know quantitative uh, uh, aspects of domain walls, but it can give us some insight into the relative um, energetics of different types of domain walls. So in particular, in going um, from this domain um, here to this domain, we can look at what is the um, midpoint or barrier structure that you need to go through. Um, it's indicated here by this green dot, um, and it has a this symmetry PBAM. And then with density functional theory, I can constrain to that symmetry and relax um, the Sumerian barium manganite structure and see what its energy would be um, in this um, barrier structure. And we get out these um, particular energies where zero is the ground state energy. Um, here I've done these calculations with ferromagnetic and A-type antiferromagnetic spin orders. The CE-type order is not um, stable in this structure. Um, we can also look at other types of, um, and so this you know, wall here corresponds to a charge order in a polar domain wall. We can also look at other um, walls, for example, going from um, between these two domains, um, construct the barrier structure and calculate its energy. We find this one's much higher, and then there's this other third one here, um, going through this purple point, which has sort of a barrier in between. Um, and we could construct, you know, past these other domains, but the barriers would be the same as what I already have up here. Um, however, we do need to consider a path from this domain, one of these domains, to a domain in the orthorhombic twin. Um, and that, and we can look at the barrier for um, that path, and that actually has a very um, low um, energy barrier. All right, so, um, an interesting, um, so we have this set of paths, and then um, a question is, um, are these the lowest energy paths between these domains, or could we find something lower? And in particular, for these two um, uh, paths here that have that high barrier, um, we can construct a lower energy um, two-step path. So what I mean by that is, for example, for this path, instead of going you know, directly from one domain to the other, we could instead you know, go to the domain in the orthorhombic twin, through this low energy um, barrier and then go um, back um, via this two-step um, path. And so what that means is that this you know, high energy path here is unstable to splitting into these 
to lower energy paths. Um, so to summarize that, um, we find that there's these two um, low energy paths between domains. This one here, which corresponds to a charge order at 180 degree polar wall, the one here, which is a ferroelastic and 90 degree polar wall, and all the other um, paths between domains um, are unstable to splitting into pairs at these low energy paths. Now, sort of an interesting consequence of having this, you know, large number of domains in this um, set of, you know, paths or domain walls with an energy hierarchy is you can get a formation of um, domain wall vortices where you have multiple domain walls merging together. Um, and uh, by um, analyzing this, we find um, two types of these domain wall vortices um, uh, where we have either three domain walls merging or um, four domain walls merging involving these low energy paths. All right, so I'll just finish up by talking a little bit about um, stabilizing um, competing phases in Sumerian barium meganite. Um, so the first is um, looking at the um, domain walls. So all of the um, barrier structures that I identified in the um, previous analysis, they all host either ferromagnetic or A-type anti-ferromagnetic metallic states. So, you know, could these um, competing states stabilize at the domain walls of Sumerian barium manganite? Um, and in particular, um, the um, structural and the CE-type anti-ferromagnetic domains are um, coupled. So the CE-type ground state magnetic order is actually interrupted at these structural domain walls, which could give um, some room for these competing magnetic phases to stabilize. Um, so based on these you know, bulk energy surface calculations, I can't make a definitive statement about you know, whether these states would happen or not. But there is some um, interesting examples from other manganites. For example, um, an enhanced conductivity observed at charge order domain walls in a Ruddleston popper manganite and some ferrometall ferromagnetic metallic um, edge states in mang manganite strips. Um, the second um, way to look at um, stabilizing competing phases is then going to thin films and looking at epitaxial strain. And so by looking at the strain dependence of these different phases, I've, we've found that you know, under compressive strain, this um, ferromagnetic um, metallic phase can be stabilized. All right, so that brings me to the end of my talk. I'd just like to briefly end with a couple points sort of related to outlook. So one is, you know, I've focused this talk just on this particular manganite, Sumerian barium manganese oxide, but um, many of our results um, uh, generalized to other half-doped manganites, both A-site ordered and some non-A-site ordered ones. So exploring this in the context of other rare earth manganites. And then we'd also be very interested in collaboration with experimental group to um, explore this um, domain structure further. So thank you for your attention. So open the floor to questions. One over here. Uh, thank you for your talk, very nice. Uh, have you calculated the polarization? Maybe you mentioned that. Uh, the ferroelectric polarization. Did oh, the ferroelectric polarization. Um, I, mean, I have not calculated it myself, but like from the experimental literature they were estimating, it was like a couple microcoulombs per centimeter squared. Sorry, how much? A couple microcoulombs okay. per centimeter squared. Thanks. It's not a structural question, but have you quantified the charge order? I mean, how, how the charges of manganese, uh, nominally manganese 3 plus and manganese 4 plus? Um, yeah, so within the DFT calculation, I mean, it's not 3 plus and 4 plus, but um, it, uh, there's certainly a very variation in this checkerboard. Um, so it's maybe differing by like, Point four or so, something like that. Anyone else? So I know this is all about Samarium, um, but on one of the first slides you showed uh, the plot of all of the different rare earths, and neodymium was right on a phase boundary. Yeah. Uh, do you think the same analysis would apply to neodymium, and maybe that's a, a better place for trying to stabilize different competing phases? Um, yes, I think. Um, yeah, I think that that could be um, a good place to look because then the, the phases might be closer um, in energy. 
Um, I know that um, sort of the experimental literature on this, neodymium, barium, I think there's sort of been some, some different um, uh, structures and magnetic orders um, reported as the ground state. But there is one paper I've seen that actually reported a polar structure for that one as well. OK, if there's no more questions, we'll go on. Oh, one more. Just a quick comment. I mean, this material looks uh, terribly similar to lead zirconite in many, many aspects, uh, but you have the chemical stacking, but actually the main, the dominant order parameters are the same, actually. Yeah. Of course, here you have a polar distortion, which I guess you wouldn't have if you didn't have the varian samarian stacking. And uh, it really looks very much like lead zirconite. So I don't know if you have familiar with the literature on the compound, but uh, I think it would be nice to have a look because. Yeah, yeah, I know you have, have a so paper on lead zirconite, and it does have this um, stripe distortion or sigma two mode. So yeah, so the it's very similar. Stripe distortion is exactly what people call the antiferroelectric motion in, a in lead zirconite, and uh, it's dominated by the tilt, as in your case. It's, it's yeah, very yeah, no, that's. I agree that that's good for further comparison. I think, yeah. Okay. Thank the speaker. Our last speaker for this session is Yubo Chi, and he'll talk about the mechanism of polarization switching in charge order induced ferroelectrics. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction, and uh, it is my great pleasure to talk about our recent research mechanism of polarization switching in charge order induced ferroelectrics. my own. I'm sorry, there was something wrong with the pointer. Okay. So, in strongly correlated materials, the charges for transition metal I-terms can disproportionate, leading to a break of the symmetry and the ferroelectricity. One of the most famous charge order induced ferroelectric material is lutetium ferrite. Previous experimental works has, have already confirmed that lutetium ferrite has two different kind of polarized state. However, PE hysteric loop, which is a sign of polarization flipping under electric field, has not been observed. Another famous example of charge order induced ferroelectrics is magnetite. Magnetite has a very big and complex primitive cell. Different from, different from lutetium ferrite, 
it is wi widely accepted that its polarization is flippable under electric field. Besides, there is another charge out there induced by electricity in super lattices. This is a structure which was proposed in the previous paper from our group. Less than one date and the strontium one date is also ferroelectric. It has a perovskite structure with lanthanum and the strontium atrium occupying the A sites, and the vanadium atrium, which can disproportionate into vanadium 3 and the vanadium 3 plus and the vanadium 4 plus, occupy, occupying the B site. In this talk, I will focus on this material, and later I will demonstrate that the charge ordering pattern of this material is strongly coupled to its light distortion. And its light distortion has a significant influence on the polarization dynamics under electric field. This slide shows the outline of this talk. In the beginning, based on the super lattice, I will introduce two kinds of light dis distortion coupling to the uh, coupling to the charge ordering, polyhedral breathing and off-centering displacement. Based on the types of the light distortion coupling to the charge ordering, I will classify all the charge ordering materials into two different categories. And next, I will demonstrate that the polarization dynamics of such two different types of charge ordering systems are dramatically different. And finally, we will apply our theory to explain the experimental observations in magnetite and lutetium ferrite. The first light distortion I would like to introduce is uh, polyhedral breathing. The polyhedral breathing uh, can be quanti quantified by the ratio between the volume of the two polyhedrons associated with different vanadium atoms. Generally, the, arc the oxygen oxygen associated with the vanadium 4 plus should be smaller compared with that associated with vanadium 3 plus because the ionic size of 4 plus is smaller than vanadium 3 plus. The other light distortion is called of center displacement, which can be quantified by the distance between the center of a polyhedron to the position of the vanadium. Generally speaking, vanadium 4 plus has a larger displacement, also because of the ionic size effect, because in the perovskite structure, the smaller the B side ion is, the larger the displacement is. Okay, in this talk, in this study, we carry out density functional theory plus U calculations for the super lattice structure, and we found for the optimized structure, the value of R is 0.91. Then we artificially increase R to 1, and for each R value, we optimize the structure with only R fixed. We can see that as R going, to, to, as R going toward 1, the off-centering displacement of modernium 4 plus keeps increasing, which means if we artificially take away the polyhedral breathing character, the other effect of centering effect will take over and become dominant. To further investigate how the stability of different polarized charge ordering states, the stability of such two states can be affected by the light distortion. We generate different structures with different R values and the different displacements of the two vanadium atoms. And for each atomic structure, we calculate two, an, two energies of two electronic states. And for the first electronic state, the bottom vanadium is vanadium 3 plus. As a result, its polarization is pointing up. And for the other electronic structure, the bottom vanadium is 4 plus, and its polarization is pointing down. This is the energy landscape for equal, R equal to 1, and as a function, uh, as a function of the displacements of the two vanadium, we can see that this energy landscape is separated into two parts by the diagonal. And in the upper part, 
it corresponds to the structure in which the vanadium-3 atom has a smaller displacement and its polarization is pointing up. And for the other half, it corresponds to the structure with polarization pointing down. Because of the symmetry, we can see that the energies corresponding to the local minima uh, are identical. Then we decrease R a little bit by shrinking the volume of the polyhedron at the bottom. We can see that the R polarized state is less stable. And there is an energy difference between the top two polarized state. If we decrease R further, the energy difference increases further. And here, we should mention that for this R value, this local minimum is very shallow. But we should also note that this R value is, very, is still far away from the optimized R value, which is 0.317. And for such a wide R value, we cannot generate such an energy landscape because the R polarized state is no longer a local minimum. If we put the extra electron in the vanadium, it will automatically go to the other vanadium. So as a result, we cannot calculate the energy difference between two electronic states directly. But we can estimate this value according to the values we have. We plot the energy difference between the two polarized states for so our values close to one. Then we extrapolate the line. And from the intersection with the line corresponding to R equals to the optimized value, we estimate the energy difference, which is 340 MeV per formula unit, which is quite large. And uh, in order to induce such a polarization flipping, such a big energy difference should be compensated, which requires a larger than 16 MV per centimeter electric field, which is unrealistic. Next, in DFT calculation, we apply electric field up to 13 MV per centimeter onto the silver lattice with the Barry's phase method. We didn't observe any polarization flipping. We should also note, during the application of electric field, the R ratio changes very little. This is because this polyhedral breathing mode is infrared active, and uh, it does not respond any to the electric field. And as we mentioned before, for such an R value, it requires an electric field larger than 16 MV per centimeter. As a result, the polarization cannot flip. So till so far, we demonstrate that polarization flipping under electric field cannot be achieved in polyhedral breathing type charge ordering system. But how about the other type, the off-centering displacement type? Here, we use a fixtures invented example, which is also such a silver lattice, but we fix R equal to one, which means we artificially remove the polyhedral breathing character. And uh, we apply electric field, and at each electric field, we fix the R value. We indeed observe a polarization flipping at the electric field equals to 2.5 MV per centimeter, which can be achieved in experiments. And the mechanism is that such a lattice mode is directly coupled to electric field. And the electric field can lower the energy barrier between the up and down states and induce the polarization flipping. Okay, so this page shows the comparison between the two types of charge ordering materials. The take home message is that uh, the polyhedral breathing type cannot have the polar polarization switchable by an electric field because the lattice mode is infrared inactive. But the polarization in the uh, off centering displacement type charge ordering materials, it can be switched by electric field. But the example we use here is only a fixtures one. Later, I we will apply our theory onto real materials, such as lutetium ferrite and uh, magnetite. Here, we should emphasize because the atoms with different valence states are not orderly stacked as a superlattice structure. As a result, we can no longer use the R ratio 
to characterize the polyhedral breathing. We use another physical quantity, which relates to the difference between the volume of a specific oxygen and the average volume of the oxygen in the entire crystal. As a result, a smaller polyhedron will give a negative QPB, and a larger one will give a positive value. So in this slide, we plot the magnitudes of light distortion for different items in different materials. Each bar corresponds to a transition metal item, and the blue bars correspond to the items with a low valence state, and the uh, orange ones correspond to items with high valence states. And here, we can see that in lutetium ferrite, the six polyhedron, they have noticeable difference in the sizes of the polyhedron, which is, uh, which is similar to the unstricted superlattice case. As a result, it is a polyhedral breathing type charge ordering system. And uh, as we demonstrated before, its polarization cannot be flipped by an external electric field, which explains why we cannot observe uh, polarization flipping in experiments. However, Magnar type is a little different. Here, we plot the magnitudes of the 64 atoms in the primitive cell, which are involved in charge ordering. We can see for several atoms, their polyhedral breathing magnitudes are very tiny, indicating that for such polyhedrons, the characters are of centering displacement. And as we mentioned before, for such a type, such a type of, pol type of charge ordering materials, its polarization can be flipped by electric field. In this slide, we show more details about the mechanism of polarization flipping in Magnar type. Uh, here, in each primitive cell, primitive cell, it has more than 200 atoms, and 64 atoms, 64 iron involved in charge ordering. As a result, because of the huge computational cost, we cannot use first principle method to simulate the electric field. Instead, we use a semi-classical method. We assume that each iron, each iron has approximately the same dynamic matrix. As a result, we can simulate electric field by uniformly displacing the iron atoms. And before the displacing and after displacing, we calculate the bond valences of all the 64 atoms. And in each case, we assume that the 34 iron atoms with the smallest bond valence are iron 2 plus, and the other half are iron 3 plus. Here, I should also emphasize the sequence of the atoms are exactly the same as the sequence of the atoms in this graph. We can see that if we apply electric field, Compared with the original figure, the oxidation states of these atoms flip and induce a change in polarization. The change of the polarization induced by a such a change in the charge ordering pattern is about five micro Coulomb, Coulomb per centimeter square, which is in the same order of magnitude, in the same order of magnitude with the, with the experimental results. Okay, so in summary, in this talk, we talk about the charge ordering system and uh, introduce two types of distortion, and based on the types of distortion, I, we classify the charge, charge ordering materials into two categories, and they have different, dramatically different polarization dynamics under electric field. And uh, we emphasize that only the off-centering displacement type, its polarization can be flipped by electric field. And we hope our study can provide future guidance about searching for switchable charge ordering ferroelectric. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thanks, any questions? So in the magnetite case where you have this flipping of the, yeah, uh, this one. So where you have the flipping of the, the yeah. Are these all in the same layer? So is it four, four in one layer and then there's, there's a flip in the next layer up? Um, 
if we check the position of the SI terms, it is not necessary that uh, they occupy the labyrinth layer. Okay. Layers. Actually, they could be quite far away. Okay, so yeah. they're not correlated where they are in the positions, okay. Yeah. So, sorry uh, if you said this, but what's the space group for the magnetite case? Uh, sorry, I couldn't memorize exactly. It should be something around CC, space group nine. Okay, and the, the, the switching uh, fields you talked about, I mean, they seem big to me. I mean, uh, are, are they within the, um, you know, before there's dielectric uh, breakdown uh, in these systems? Uh, sorry. You, the fields you mentioned, uh, like uh, uh, two or over two <coughs> megavolts per centimeter. Yeah. Uh, are, are those uh, are those within uh, what you can support in these materials before yeah. they break down? I think so because in previous experiments, uh, they mentioned that the value for flipping the polarization is 1.7 mE per centimeter, is approximately the same. Maybe a little different, but in the same order of magnitude with the value in our study. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. That's it then. Well, thank you very much for your talk. <laughs> thank you. I'm back here at 410. Sorry, I'm <laughs> the microphone. Thank you.
looked into this earlier, but um, yeah. so so where is the 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 um, their line is coming out? Out of this this time zone, and the only person there could have been the guy with the huge red thing. Yeah. Or this next to him, the guy who's coming from the east. Right for it. Yeah. Um, Did I unplug it? It's going to mess it up. No, you can unplug it. Yeah, you can definitely unplug it. Okay. Just play for it. Right. So so here's what I thought. I no, thought. But, but that's not you. It's what is that? Okay. Oh, okay. So here's what, what I thought is I would bring this in. Mm -hmm. And this will go right in there and then has two outputs. Oh, you have a display port. And okay. One would go back yeah, that in. sounds great. The other would go back into this. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. So what happens when you do that? Okay, we have a few minutes. Can we try it? I mean, it seems like it's just electronic. It ought to work. You want to? Uh, you can do no, this at the same time. Okay. Oh, no, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, you can do this at the same time. So I wanted to. Yeah, try yeah. It as let's well on let's just uh, st stick it in here and uh, copy it to the to the uh, desktop. I'm not a PC person, so uh, neither am I. So uh, what what do you have to do to get this to appear? Somebody showed me earlier that you have to. Maybe go to the start to the window. Yeah. Really? Uh, five there? Oh, so that shows it? the devices. No, but it's showing it's empty. Did you put something on there? I did. Because that's showing. Nothing on it. Uh, oh, there it is. Okay, great. I think you're good. Okay, so now I just uh, and reject this somehow. I think it's over here. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, which one was it? Uh, yeah. Which one? Yep. Oh, wow. It actually works. Yeah, and, and then we'll have this uh, automated thing here. Make sure this works. Yay! Wow, how come it just worked for you? You must Probably have a won't magic use touch. The slide <laughs> I can't do more than one thing at the same time. So I can use the laser pointer or I can advance the slide. Well, this is all on the same tape. I, I know, but I. The laser pointer is the red dot. Is it green or red? It's red. I'm, I just ordered a green one for tonight, okay. but I won't have it today, so it doesn't matter. Okay. So yeah, yeah. So that one worked. Okay. Where so did you put it, Nicole, on the desktop? Or yeah, yeah. Just yeah. stick it on the desktop and make sure your name's on it. So, so that it can be. Yeah. So if you just plug in your USB. I had to dig this out of the depths of my bag. Oh well, I have a. <laughs> <laughs> I have a pile of USB. I have vir virgin, virgin, virgin USBs. USB drives. Yeah, yeah. So that nobody can be worried about viruses. So. As I say, this might be it. Yeah. Somewhere. You can just drag that over, and then when it's done, just reject the drive. Yeah, let's check it first. Yeah, here. yeah. I used a slightly weird font. I just want to make sure it came out. Oh. Nicole, like Nicole ruined it. Right. Uh, 
just a matter of just switching the frame. Uh, the frame? Uh, I think that's primary, right? Yeah, yeah, I think there's a, there's a thing just to the tell it. Do, uh, Windows key. Here, I'll just tell it to not. No, no, I think there's a key to hit. Key, yeah. Oh, okay. No. No, it's over here now. So you then say oh, duplicate. Okay, yeah. yeah, that's what'll work. All right, let's try it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, that's the trick. Yeah. Windows key. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Looks pretty good. Yeah, last time I touched Windows, it was and then when you eject that, yes, so we put the clicker thing in. Absolutely. Okay. Is it going to tell me it's safe? I presume it's safe. Um, did you eject it? I did. Okay. I'm going to take it out. Okay, Wait. and then this goes in. Okay, great. Good. Have a, why don't I have a, this I had earlier, I don't understand. We just had it a minute ago, and now I don't have a cursor. I don't understand this. Um, Is that good? Uh, how about now? So let's see. I, I wonder if it's just a connection problem, because I just wiggled it and it changed. I, I wonder if it's just connection. So, I don't know what your thing's showing.
think it's a, a takeover from entry problem because when I look up at the Twitter shows of the show, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's as I look at it, it's not every one of these connected. Uh, now all the lights are on. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I bet it's okay to see here, but it wasn't as long as Okay. The wrong display is getting sent. So we have like this. So the problem is, is that it's uh, on duplicate, which should be okay, you know, except that he's getting a different screen. So somehow this is sending. You don't have to record mine. Like if that solves the yeah, problem. Yeah, that's what he's getting. It's just that. Can we make everything just mirrored so that there's not two separate displays? Yeah, it's a little screen. Yeah, we want uh, like one, two, and three, but they're all the same. Oh, great. Duplicate on two and three. Try that. No, see, that's what he's seeing in the back. Okay. So let's see. Duplicate. Well, let me just wait a second. Okay, this sure. Is, this is not moving the whole time. So they all see it as a little tab. Looks like it doesn't really manage the three displays. <laughs> we can't make all three equal? Uh, it, it knows about three there. Yeah, it knows about three, but then it's... Uh, so maybe try one and three? No, duplicate on one and three. Try that, because mm. we tried two and three last time. Yeah, but then I expect like one. See, they're looking at the wrong thing, I think. But maybe, what we can do...
the trail here for days. Uh, ben, ben is going to show us. And we don't need it on here. I don't need it. Uh, what are these? They're down in these Mississippi monitor too. Yeah, but I'm not, I'm not sure it's going to show what it's going on. Is it? I think I'm going to try that. Uh, ben, you see, this is. No, but this I know how to switch that, though. You can this thing duplicate it. No, it is already uh, 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 okay. okay. We can do this. Blah. Okay. May, maybe we'll have to see. We'd have to see what he gets now because this is yeah. the problem we have with yeah. him. With his uh, Michael, what are you seeing now? Oh, you'll see the presenter. Can we turn off the presenter view Actually, altogether? Yes, I think. Yeah. Well, you don't really need it here because you're going to be staying like over there or something, right? You want the presenter view? Let's just see if we can yeah, redo it. It's possible we can do it. What happens here? Oh, we're not using it. What's going oh, on? Oh, Steve, you've got a slide sh sharing? Yeah. Oh, we do. Uh, that's the little arrow. Says you, you were asking for the. Uh, how come we don't have? How come we don't have anything here anymore? You don't know what you have now. Really, have the presenter view turned off altogether? That's weird because. Uh, yeah, this one was showing the same thing right now. Or no, actually, I. Yeah. Well, why Advanced isn't that? Uh, yeah, why isn't that? Why isn't that advancing? Able to switch the cloud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How come we can't? Oh, this is pretty incredible. Yeah, except now we can't advance the slide. You ought to be able to advance the slide. Oh, okay. Well, that looks better. Now, when well, yeah, you should have the same on two and three. Yeah, but so why don't the slides advance? Actually, yeah, I'm thinking that now, if you switch on not the presenter view here, maybe. Well, he's probably going to get the wrong thing again. Okay, this is what. Now that's working. Okay. No? That's weird. Oh, there. That's okay. No, that looks okay. That's not okay. Is that good or That's not? Okay. okay. Now, what does Michael get? In principle, it should You're be. You're okay? Okay. Don't breathe. 
Shelly, <laughs> I think Lane's first. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should switch the order of the talks. Okay, well, let's try to bring up his then. Uh, so that, that's a Dave. I, I'm turning, I'm, I'm shutting these off so we can bring his up, hopefully. If one works, the old, it will all work. Where's, where's uh, Lane? Oh no. Oh no. I think we can extend this. Is it you or is it extend instead of duplicate? No, here I, I did switch. Switch swap. Oh, this is incredible. <laughs> How's that? That works. Well, I don't know. Michael, are you okay? <sighs> yeah, do you know how these things work? <laughs> yeah. That, the problem is we have three displays and we're not getting the right thing. We've got it on right on two and not on three. Each time we put a new presentation on, we just do the same thing again. It's okay now or not? No. no? Duplicate. Well, then we're getting this everywhere. We, we, we want the full screen one. I, oh yeah, I have it. Oh, you have it. Okay. Yeah, it's in the tube here. I haven't put it up yet. Yeah. If you want to hang it up, that'd be a big help. It's in this tube here. Oh. Right here. In a slideshow, so maybe it's in there. I know, isn't it infuriating? Yeah, I, somebody actually made this software and it's supposed to be a commercial product. I don't know.
this one. Okay. Yeah, it's open twice. Now I don't, I'm not getting it to go into display mode. There's two windows at the bottom. Oh. Yeah, but I don't know if he's got it in the back. <laughs> All right. At least we can do this. Okay. Uh, is it time? We have three minutes. Well, we have everything but the recording. Someone needs to get it and leave it here.
Great, thank you. Uh, and thank you to the organizers for the invitation to be here. It's always a, a really great meeting, lots of really uh, uh, nice talks and a deep dive into a really exciting field. Uh, so yeah, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about pyroelectrics and electric calorics today and some of the things that we've been working on and, and touch a little bit on how we measure these things as well. Um, so before I jump into that, let me acknowledge the people who actually do all of the uh, hard and important work. So this is a picture of our group uh, back at Berkeley. Uh, the work that you'll see today was primarily done by my now former student. He graduated just this last year, Shashir Pandya. Uh, but there's also some nice work from my uh, current grad student, Gabe Velarde, and others uh, as we go through. We, of course, have great collaborators uh, around the country and around the world, and we're always thankful to those folks who, who help pay the bills for these kind of things. Uh, okay, so why pyroelectric and electrocaloric effects? Well, uh, we, we should start where, you know, uh, at an important point, we decided to go without you. Sorry, Ron. <laughs> uh, we're all kind of familiar with the Heckman diagram here and, and all the intricacies of the cross-coupling functions that come out of these exciting materials that we work on. And in particular, on this side is where we're interested today in these electrothermal effects, uh, pyroelectricity, electrocaloric effects, and, and these sorts of things. And these have been used over the years for lots of different applications. I'm showing just a few of them here. Uh, lots of things with thermal sensing. We can uh, convert waste heat into electrical energy with these systems, or you can run these things in, in reverse and get solid state cooling. Uh, here's an example of, uh, of uh, some thermally driven electron emission systems. You can think about these. These are arrays of effectively AFM tips where we coated them with ferroelectrics and then drove them with really rapid temperature changes, and then electrons would spew out of the surface of these, of these AFM tips of these systems. So you can do all these sorts of things. Now, if you compare what has been done in the electrothermal world to things maybe on this electromechanical effect side, uh, what you'll find is that while there have been sustained efforts, in particular in dielectric and piezoelectric effects, to, uh, to understand the fundamental physics of what's going on, there's quite a bit less in the electrothermal world. Uh, and that includes a relatively poor understanding of the fundamental materials physics, what's going on, insufficient access to well-controlled materials that enable you to study these things at a fundamental level, and uh, really there have been inadequate measurement protocols over the years that have led to kind of uh, misleading ideas in this, in this regard as well. So there's a lot of need for, for attention in this space. Now one other thing that's motivating us, and we've done a lot of things on this pyroelectric energy conversion uh, aspect, just to give you some sense of the scope of the problem here, uh, this is a map showing the energy resources in the United States. So everything here on this side over here is showing the source energies that we put into the system, and then they flow through all these different systems, some used for electricity generation and various other uh, uh, locations where these things are used. What you see on the right-hand side here is where this energy ends up. This is the stuff that is actually used, and this is the stuff that is rejected as waste heat. That is about 68% of all the energy we put into the system on the left-hand side ends up as waste heat on the right-hand side. And if you break that down even further, uh, the vast majority of it happens in this relatively low-quality waste heat regime, okay, below 230 degrees C. So if you have a high quality heat, you can have things like Rankin cycles and thermoelectrics that are quite good at harvesting these medium and high quality waste heats, but there's relatively little uh, that can be done with this low quality waste heat. It's a, a largely untapped resource. Uh, and so there's a big opportunity to both reduce carbon emissions, but also recover lots of money uh, in doing this. And so these pyroelectric materials are important uh, in, in this sense, in this low uh, energy, uh, low quality waste heat regime. So this is kind of a background point for us. All right, so if we're gonna study pyroelectrics and electrocalorics, we need ways of measuring these sorts of things. And so what my group has focused on over the, actually probably almost 10 years at this point, we've been trying these things, uh, is, is building in integrated uh, measurement protocols and platforms. And so we're gonna measure pyroelectric effects using uh, what's called a two, uh, a two omega method. And we're gonna measure electrocaloric effects using what's called a three omega or a three omega derived method, okay? This is a measurement used in thermal transport community that we've kind of adapted for these materials. So what you ultimately do is you create little capacitor structures of your thin film materials with these integrated uh, uh, structures on top of them. So this is a, picture, a microscope picture of these real things. If you had done th uh, thermal transport measurements, this would look a heck of a lot like a three omega system. We just basically stole that same idea. So you can create these device structures and then fabricate through to create these, these structures. And this allows us to either uh, source It's back. Uh, what was I talking about? Yes, we can either source uh, heat uh, and measure the pyroelectric response, or we can apply a bias across these films and, and measure the temperature change in these systems. 
So we can create these out of the classic materials. Here's an example for just 2080 PZT on serranium titanate. These are hysteresis loops measured from these kind of devices. Everything looks pretty good. Uh, you can measure dielectric permittivity and, uh, and loss as a function of frequency. Everything looks good in these devices, right? So we have these functional little device structures. Now we need to actually measure the properties of these things. So let's start with pyroelectrics. This is the measurement uh, setup here. So same idea, we're gonna put some current through this heater line here, and we're gonna measure the voltage or the, the current that flows through the capacitor structure based on this. So we're applying a AC uh, heating bias to the heater line. This is creating a power dissipation and an actual temperature change at two omega. So we apply it at omega and we get the power at two omega. And then using kind of established uh, thermal models for the geometry, so we have to control the shape and size of these things a little bit, you can actually calculate very ac accurately the temperature oscillation inside of your ferroelectric capacitor. And then you can just measure your pyroelectric co uh, uh, current uh, and get your coefficients using this kind of lock-in based measurement, uh, frequency dependent measurement. So you can do these sorts of things. So here's the temperature changes. That's the black data here. So if we do it slow, we get big temperature changes. If we do it fast, we get smaller temperature changes. This red data is the measured pyro co, uh, current in the system, and here is the calculated pyro coefficient for the system. So using our technique, we've demonstrated that we can measure uh, pyro currents as l uh, less than about 10 picoamps inside of these capacitor structures, so relatively sensitive. You can use these same techniques, same approaches to do these electrocaloric measurements in these systems. We do it a little bit different now. We're applying electric field across the thickness of our capacitor, and we're using this line here as a thermometer to sense the temperature change in the capacitor structure. We measure that with a Wheatstone bridge-like uh, uh, setup. So here we're applying this applied field, uh, typically some sign uh, variation in field to the system, to the ferroelectric. We're measuring the electrocaloric power. We can actually separate the power uh, that goes into electrocaloric cooling uh, at, with uh, joule heating from losses in these systems by locking into the different uh, frequency uh, dependent signals that come out of this. So there's a caloric part and a joule heating part that we can get. So you can measure these sorts of things, and depending on which one of these kind of uh, 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 peaks related to the frequency, you can pull out different information uh, in the system. Here we've demonstrated that we can measure temperature changes in these capacitors down to about two millikelvin in these systems. So we can be pretty accurate in that regard. All right, so we have these ways of measuring it. Now, we wanna measure pyroelectricity. It's what we'll focus on for most of it here today. Uh, so we should make sure we have some feeling of what can contribute to pyroelectric response overall. So we have the total response, this pyroelectric coefficient, uh, and it can be built up of a lot of different components. So the first one is the intrinsic response. This is just the temperature dependence of the polarization in the system. We have to scale this by the fraction of the domains that are contributing in these materials. You can also have so-called extrinsic contributions. This res uh, uh, results from the temperature driving changes in the domain structure in these materials. And so as the temperature changes and you get changes in domain structure, this can give rise to its own contribution. These two things together are typically called the primary pyroelectric response. Now, when we do this in thin films, we also have to worry about something called a secondary pyroelectric response. This is coming from the thermal expansion mismatch between the film and the substrate, which gives rise to a temperature-driven stress, which changes the polarization, which gives rise to this secondary pyroelectric response. And there's some uh, expressions that you can see uh, for these sorts of behaviors. So we need to know thermal expansion coefficient, uh, uh, mechanical stiffness and compliance sorts of things, piezoelectric coefficient. You can also have other contributions, things like tertiary effects. Uh, this is coming from inhomogeneous temperatures inside of your material. I generally try to avoid this because it's small and hard to measure, and so we pur purposely try to get the temperature uh, as consistent across the thickness of the film as we can. So we have about less than about one or two percent deviation in the temperature profile across the thickness of our films based on the se device setups that we use. So we can typically uh, ignore this. And then finally, if you do things that apply to electric field, and some of the applications do require you to change the field while you're doing this, you can have a dielectric contribution to the pyroelectric response. This comes from the fact that this electric field creates a, a change in the polarization, which also is a function of temperature. And so you can have this dielectric response as well. So despite knowing all of these things, there have been very few studies that directly study these effects and break them out in, in detail. Uh, over the years, this is, uh, again, there's a summary of some of the things we've been doing. We started by looking at this from a phenomenological point of view. These are just GLD-type simulations, trying to figure out where the different contributions might be big in, say, PZT as a function of uh, titanium content in these systems or strain. 
We did a little bit of measurements over the years on model systems where we could measure some domain structures and pull these things out, but there just aren't a lot of measurements in this regard. So we've primarily relied on modeling to predict where we get large pyroelectric coefficients, and there's very few studies that directly do this. So we needed some attention to try to, to address these sorts of things. So I'm gonna try to show you two examples of how we can do this today, now that we've kind of matured a little bit in how we think about it. So the first is using our ability to create model versions of these materials as epitaxial thin films to help us have model systems to probe these kinds of effects. So if I take a look, this is for PZT, uh, uh, in particular on the titanium rich side, I can look at the temperature strain phase diagram for this system. And depending on the substrate that I pick, I can end up with different kinds of domain structures in the system. So if I start with relatively large compressive strains, I can get purely C out of plane polarized films. If I start to reduce that compressive strain here into this middle, I can get mixtures of C and A, so out of plane and in plane polarized domain structures. If I move on to the slightly tensile strain, uh, onto the tensile strain side, I can have purely in-plane oriented, so A1, A2 kinds of structures. And actually in the middle between them, you can have a, a, a mixture of both CA and A1, A2. So you get this beautiful array of domain structures, a mixture of in-plane and out-of-plane domain variants in these systems. And so we have these very complex domain structures which we can tune with strain and it gives us a nice way to have both quantifiable domain structures that could enable us to kind of measure these sorts of effects. So we started with a system like this, uh, and what we wanted to do is try to understand how varying the strain state and the domain structure impacts the evolution of the pyroelectric responses in these materials. So here's just a few examples. If we start on terbium scandate substrates, that's over here at high compressive strains, we have at room temperature, and this is at 450 kel Kelvin, this is a, a, just an AFM image as a function of temperature, we have a C domain structure, and it stays C domain as we heat it up. If we start in the middle here, uh, this is on gadolinium scandate in the CA phase, we go from having lots of CA, and as you heat it up, you see a reduction in the amount of A domains in the structure. And finally, if you go into this mixed phase regime where you have a mixture of CA and A1A2, uh, as you heat up, you see a, a variation in the amount of these domains as well. So we go to more A1A2, and we lose CA fraction. So here we have a system where we have a monodomain C structure, and we have different films that have different fractions of C and A, and they vary in different ways as a function of temperature. Not surprisingly to anyone in this room, this also, changing these domain structures also changes the other properties, so you can see evolution of the polarization. As we increase the A domains, the measured out-of-plane polarization goes down, and the dielectric response goes up in these systems. So everything kind of makes sense. So we use strain to control the domain structures. We can go from monodomain to these complex multi-domain structures. The domain structures strongly impact properties like polarization and dielectric response. How do they affect pyroelectric response in these materials? And in particular, what are the domain wall structures, the domain structures contributing? So to extract these sorts of things, we do a couple of tricks. So the first thing that we can do is we can measure the pyroelectric response. So this is the pyroelectric coefficient as a function of the measurement frequency, the heating frequency of the system. So as we increase the frequency here, uh, we can get to a regime at about a, a kilohertz where we can effectively turn off this secondary contribution that comes from the thermal expansion mismatch because we're confining the heat primarily to the film. We're not heating up the substrate any dramatic amount. So we can see then that there's a variation in, in the pyroelectric coefficient. It goes down and kind of levels out as we get past these values. So we can use this to extract the amount that comes from these secondary contributions. It's on the order of maybe 10, 20% in, the, in a lot of these systems. We can then also do pyroelectric measurements here as a function of DC electric field in the system. So we can make these hysteresis loops that show us what's happening. So you can actually see the dielectric response in this slope that you see to the uh, pyroelectric response here. But if you do these things at zero applied bias, you can get rid of this dielectric response as well. So if we do it at zero field and we do it at a kilohertz, we can have a nice way of measuring the total response and easily getting to what we need to know in the system. So what we can do here is measure the pyroelectric coefficient here as a function, this is of the different strain states in these materials. And we're gonna use the monodomain sample to get a good measure, a reference value for the intrinsic response of this material. It has no domain structures, it's a monodomain system. And we can actually make a scaled uh, estimate of what we expect the intrinsic response to be for all of these materials just based on the evolution of the polarization. This is probably reasonably valid because we're far away from the transition temperature in all of these materials. All right, so using that, we can make this kind of black line that you see here. This is kind of the expected intrinsic response based on the evolution of the polarization. And when we do the measurements, those are the red dots, we see that there's variations. These variations come from 
the extrinsic effects in these materials because we've turned off the secondary effects and we've turned off the dielectric response. So what we see is that there's some interesting behavior. As we go through the uh, smaller compressive strains, this is positive, and it turns negative when we go into the tensile strain regime. So in the monodomain samples, we have no domains. We have zero extrinsic contribution. In compressive strain, the extrinsic responses work against the intrinsic behavior in this material. They're actually positive, where the intrinsic response is negative in nature. So this makes sense, because if you heat these things up, you go to have more C phase in the system. So the system is actually rotating more polarization in the out of plane direction in these materials. So they work against each other. If you go on to the tensile side over here, here as you heat this thing up, you're rotating more to be in the A phase, the in-plane polarized structure, and this gives rise to a contribution that works with the intrinsic response in these materials. So you can get an added behavior to these materials. And it can contribute up to about 30, 40% of the overall pyroelectric response can come from these, dialect, uh, from these domain wall extrinsic contributions in these materials. So if you have these kind of domains, uh, this ability to control the domain structure, you can see interesting evolution of these behaviors. We can see this show up a little bit uh, uh, more clearly, perhaps, if we look at the normalized pyroelectric coefficient. This is normalized to the room temperature response of these materials. And we look at it as a function of temperature in these materials. So if we start here, this kind of dark curve at the bottom down here is the monodomain sample. And we see that the pyroelectric coefficient goes up as the temperature goes up and approaches TC. This is what we would classically expect to happen in the system. We see something quite similar when we go into the CA domain structures. They vary a little bit at lower temperatures until they become purely C in nature. Uh, and once they do that, they look just like the monodomain samples and they kind of follow up in a similar fashion. But when you look at the samples that had these mixed phase domain structures under small uh, uh, tensile, tensile strains in these materials, here, what's happening is that the A domain fraction is going up with temperature, and this is adding this extra negative, the same sign extrinsic contribution, and that's rapidly driving these things to have a, a higher pyroelectric coefficient than you expect until they go through the full transition and get rid of having this, this change in the domain structures, then they start to come back towards the normal behavior. Just to confirm that this was really what was happening, we, we double checked this by doing some temperature dependent x-ray studies as well. Uh, so uh, we went to APS uh, and did some, uh, uh, some temperature dependent studies here. I'll just show you some examples from one of these mixed phase samples. Uh, and there are figures that have not come across in, in, in the transfer here, but there should be some very nice reciprocal space maps that you can imagine in the corner here that show exactly what I'm telling you they're doing. Uh, oh, there they are. They've decided to come up now. All right, so what you can see here is that you get uh, a temperature-dependent evolution of the A domain uh, peak intensity in this system. And you can actually, if you do this uh, appropriately, quantify this and from the x-ray measurements, make an expectation for your domain fraction change, which almost matches within about 10% what we measured experimentally uh, using our direct measurements as well. So, Using strain and temperature, we can change how these domain structure uh, uh, evolve in the system, and these can significantly contribute to the pyroelectric coefficient in these, in these materials. And this could be a very nice promising route to, to change the pyroelectric response. All right, so this response is quite complex, right? There are many possible contributions. We have this very complex expression for these sorts of things. Uh, but we wanted to question whether you could figure these things out if you don't have these kind of model materials. If I can't make a monodomain version of this system, can I still separate these things out? And so to do this, let's consider a different question. Let's consider, I showed you PZT as a function of strain before with domain structures. Now let's ask the question, how does the pyroelectric responses and contributions evolve as a function of chemistry across the phase diagram, right? So as I change the, the zirconium content in the system. So, there's a lot of work on how things like dielectric and pyroelectric, uh, piezoelectric effects change with chemistry. It's less so for the pyroelectrics. Now, the problem for us at, uh, is that we can't make monodomain versions of all these different chemistries. We don't know how to do that experimentally, and so we have to come up with other ways of sorting these things out. So if we take our expression for the total pyroelectric uh, coefficient, we can start to break this thing down and see what we can control. So we can first uh, get rid of the tertiary effect. Again, as I said before, we're trying to control the geometries and the temperature profile such that we typically have less than about 1% temperature variation across the thickness of these films, making the tertiary effect negligible overall. 
The second thing that we can work on is we can clear out these secondary effects. So we just do this as a function of temperature. And the, the key here is that we can model very accurately the thermal penetration depth in these systems. We can basically turn off the heating of the substrate uh, by going to the right frequency regimes. This shows up very clearly in, this, uh, uh, in the uh, X equals 40, uh, uh, 48 here. Uh, so this is right near the MPB for this system, where we see this big frequency dependence and then it levels off in this system. So if we do this for all of these different chemistries across the PZT phase diagram, we have measures uh, anywhere from about 70 to 29 microcoulombs per meter squared per Kelvin uh, uh, pyroelectric coefficients. And these scale, as you would expect, directly with the magnitude of the piezoelectric coefficient. So it's biggest near the MPB, where we have the biggest strain-induced changes in polarization. So tertiary, secondary, we can take care of relatively quickly. What about the dielectric response in these materials? Well, the dielectric response shows up because if you look at the permittivity as a function of temperature and as a function of field, we have this uh, d epsilon dt kind of behavior that we have to uh, understand. This is a changing as a function of temperature and field in these systems. So what we can do is we can measure these kinds of responses for the material and see what we get for these constants. So we measure for the different PZT compositions noted here, uh, and you can see these are measured near the, me uh, the temperature regime where we're doing these, these measurements uh, for the pyroelectric response. So using the same delta T window, about 19 degrees near room temperature, uh, we can measure as a function of field the evolution of the permittivity. What we see here is that these things kind of even out by about two, 300 kilovolts per centimeter. We kind of saturate out these effects, they're suppressed, uh, and the biggest effect is happening in the uh, MPB composition as well. We can then take this and we can do linear fits to these locally in the system to pull out this d epsilon dt, this value that goes inside of this, uh, these parentheses here, and we can have this value for the system, and then we can calculate the, pyroelectric uh, the dielectric contribution to pyroelectricity in these systems. What we see is quite interesting. So it's always zero at the beginning, uh, but it can get quite large in some of these systems. So near the MPB, this can be as large as about 115, 120 uh, microcoulombs per meter squared Kelvin. That's like almost the full size of the overall pyroelectric response in these systems in the opposite direction from what you'd like it to be. So we can have big dielectric responses. All right, so we had secondary and tertiary. We took care of dielectric. What about the total and the intrinsic responses in these systems? So we can do just a good old fashioned pyroelectric measurement of the whole thing overall to give us our total response. So this is the pyroelectric current as a function of electric field, and this is the uh, calculated pyro coefficient as a function of electric field this, for the system. These measurements were done at a kilohertz where we have basically turned off the secondary uh, aspect, and we can see the switching behavior that we expect for our ferroelectric systems overall. Now, what we can do is get a little bit creative about trying to pull out the intrinsic and extrinsic responses in these materials. Now, if you think about it in dielectric materials, there have been a number of ways that people have tried to separate intrinsic and extrinsic behaviors over the years, including going to low temperatures to freeze out domain wall motion and all these sorts of things. So we actually started with that sort of measurement, but there are nonlinearities in the temperature changes that happen in the measurement setup at low temperatures that make it difficult for us to accurately pull these things out. What we did instead was to do these measurements as a function of applied field, where if we go to high enough fields, we can effectively quench out extrinsic contributions. So here's these pyroelectric coefficients measured as a function of increasing DC field in the system, such that we're only left with the intrinsic behavior in these systems. And there's a number of papers in the literature that, that do these sorts of things, and then you can extract back from this using a linear extrapolation method back to kind of an intrinsic zero field value for uh, your sample in these systems. So when we do these sorts of things, what we find is that there's a relatively small E field dependence of the intrinsic response in, in these in PZT materials. Uh, and the total and, and intrinsic response both decrease with decreasing titanium content, and they can be quite large. Uh, the intrinsic contribution can be quite large. It's, it's a large fraction of what we've measured for some of these materials. Okay, so bringing it all together here, we've got to get the intrins extrinsic contribution dealt with, and then we can have a full story of what's happening. So we had this expression. The only thing that we haven't figured out here is the extrinsic contribution for these materials. And what we can do is we can solve for this in a self-consistent fashion. We've measured everything else, and we know that this extrinsic response should go to zero as it goes to high uh, fields. And so we solve until we get this thing to, to come to zero at these high applied fields. 
When we do this, uh, we did this for similar materials to the uh, um, uh, data I showed you in the first part of the talk, where we had the monodomain samples, and it matches within about 3% uh, the, the final result that we got from this approach and using the, the monodomain samples to, to check it as well. So now we have this approach to give us these sorts of behaviors, and here's the take home message, right? So now we can look at the pyroelectric coefficient as a function of composition. This is going from uh, titanium rich to zirconium rich in the system, and we've broken it out. So you see the total measurement here is this, is this line, but then we have the intrinsic, extrinsic, secondary, and dielectric responses broken out for each one of these compositions. So the total and intrinsic responses decrease as the titanium content goes down in the systems. The extrinsic contribution has a sign reversal, okay, it changes sign, it goes from being positive under, uh, at these compositions to being uh, negative at these compositions as you cross the MPB. Uh, and the dielectric and the secondary peaks uh, are, are maximized close to the MPB where you have the largest dielectric um, piezoelectric responses in these materials. So, all told, we can now separate out all these sorts of things. We can figure out what fractions of things are coming from intrinsic and extrinsic and secondary and dielectric and all these sorts of things in the system. If you're doing applications where you're applying a bias to the sample, one better pay attention to how large those dielectric responses can be. They can be some large fraction of the overall behavior that you have, and they're often opposite to what you want them to be. So the pyroelectric coefficient is a rather complex uh, uh, property, uh, and one needs a pretty fundamental understanding of the materials and its, and its structure to understand how this thing is evolving. All right, so what else can we do? A few words about calorics, uh, and then I'll try to wrap up here. So uh, we've looked, at using the same device, we've also measured uh, the electrocaloric effects. So if I take those same samples from the first half, this uh, set of PZT films that were strained at different levels, we can also measure the electrocaloric coefficient as a function of field uh, and strain. And we can see, again, differences in the intrinsic and extrinsic responses in these materials. So here, what we're finding is that under compressive and tensile strain, respectively, we see a, dis a diminishment or enhancement of the, uh, uh, of the response responses overall. So slightly different behavior for electrocaloric than pyroelectric. We can also look at other types of materials. This morning we had some data uh, of some beautiful talks about the hafnium uh, oxide based systems. We've also, like everybody else in the world, gotten a piece of these from the Fraunhofer Institute guys and done some measurements there. Uh, we see very similar things to what we talked about this morning. We see wake-up behavior in the pyroelectric responses. Uh, we see uh, reasonable pyroelectric coefficients for these systems overall. One thing that was interesting here is that if you do this as a function of wake-up cycle, this is the pyro coefficient, that's the red data, we see this wakes up uh, and, and comes eventually to kind of a, a level value. But if you measure the electrocaloric coefficient, it is uh, consistently high across all of the measurement cycles that we do, suggesting that there might be different contributions to what's going on. It is also four times larger than I would expect based on the pyro coefficient in these systems. This suggests that there might be something like defect dipoles, which kind of could be responsible for things like this pinching that you see here, giving additional configurational or dipolar entropy that could be leading to larger effects in these systems. So this is something that needs to be studied more, but points to some interesting kind of physics happening inside of these materials. All right, so with that, I should wrap up uh, and just say, I've shown you this very complex uh, pyroelectric uh, 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 coefficient property uh, today, and I've shown you kind of two approaches that can break it apart, right? So we can create model versions of materials to help us understand the different contributions, or we can use our measurement approaches to kind of separate out these effects in, in a thoughtful way. So with that, I'll thank you for your attention, and I'd be uh, happy to answer any questions. Thanks. She's got it. All right, do we have any questions? All right. Oh, well, thanks for your talk. And uh, in terms of pyroelectricity, when the frequency of applied uh, field is uh, omega, the applied heat is omega, yes. the polarization responds with two omega, right? Right. And then in terms of uh, uh, electrocaloric effect, the story is the same, right? 
Uh, yeah, so I, I buzzed through it quickly, um, but there is a is there is a frequency dependence to the to the caloric power as well, right? Okay. So the power is on two omega. There's additionally a resonance uh, uh, in in that system as well. So we can get the joule heating and the uh, electrocaloric heating are convoluted at one frequency, but you can go to higher orders and you can actually separate out these frequencies, so, these uh, contributions. Uh, so can you say that that two omega is a kind of second harmonic generation? Uh, no, it's just where it's just where the power happens at, right? So for the heater line, right? So I'm driving uh, a current through the system, and the power is just dissipated at, at two omega. That's it. It's it's nothing. It's no no fancy, you know, up conversion of frequencies there. It's just how the power is dis, uh, dissipated in the system. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one more. You can ask later. So when you report uh, here this beautiful temperature dependent or composition dependent uh, pyro effect decomposed, uh, you are doing that at a given electric field, right? And so yes, exactly. So so so, so this is going to vary. I think I put this in for 100 kilovolts per centimeter kind of applied fields, just as a reference frame. It's going to vary as I showed in that figure. So at zero bias, there's none, and it peaks for each sample. It peaks at a slightly different uh, a different temperature near where it switches, mm -hmm. of course, right in these systems. But as you drive this thing, so depending on what kind of applied bias you have, you could have a really deleterious effect happening in your system if you're driving, if you're applying a bias during the measurement of these things. You just need to know that these are there. You avoid them all at zero bias, but it, it is a function of, of field. And the other polarization that you monitor is simply the spontaneous polarization or the remanent polarization in the loop that you calculate? That's a good question. So we've actually done the measurements in, in, in both ways. So many of the things that I've shown you for these loops are almost quasi-static. They're very slow types of measurements. So you should think of that as almost at, as being at res, uh, uh, remnants in these systems. Mm -hmm. uh, we have tried to do faster measurements. It cuts down on our... Um, on the accuracy of our pyroelectric and electrocaloric measurements to do these things faster, but it's, it's a balance. So if you wanted to do that, I think we can think about ways of doing those experiments, both on field and at, rev at remnants is relatively easy, on field's a little harder. It's a good question though. All right, while Nicole sets up, we'll take your question. Do you want this too? Oh, 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 good question. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. I thought there wasn't time. So a so, uh, specific question and a general question. So a specific one is what was the silicon content of that hafnia result? Oh, geez. I don't remember. Okay. Not a lot. Okay, like the general question is, you know, people have talked about pyroelectricity and electrochlorics for yes. a long time. So why aren't there any practical uh, devices out there? I, where, where's Brendan? Uh, so right over here is, uh, is Brendan, who, who is thought of some very exciting applications, including remote energy generation based on some of these uh, systems. I would say that this field has historically suffered from uh, the fact that actually measuring temperatures is very hard. And doing these things accurately has led to a huge range of, of reported values in the literature that has made it difficult to kind of lock in on certain things. So I would say <laughs> that uh, you can optimize the devices in two ways. If you have lots of waste heat to throw away, you can optimize uh, to get power out, but the efficiency will be very low. It kind of depends on your application. If you need efficiency, then you need to do everything very slowly and the total power will go down. I think with the understanding of the materials that we have now and some of the work they've done for absorber layers and things like this, you can do a lot better than historically has been demonstrated. There are companies that have existed to try to work on these sorts of things, but it has never turned into like a real commercial application for the pyroelectrics. The European team has some beautiful data on the caloric system as well. So I, I think there's a concerted effort to, to really see what's real and what's not in this space. But why has it not turned into a full market? I don't know. All right, let's thank Lane one more time. Thanks. Practices. What are the do? It, 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 it allows you to move the cursor if you want to, but it won't do anything because it's turned off right now. Okay. All right, our next yep. speaker is Nicole Benedict, and she's talking about understanding negative thermal expansion oh, yes, yes. in ferroelectric lead titanate. And she's from Cornell, so thank you. Okay, so thank you to the organizers for uh, inviting me. So I'd like to tell you about some work uh, in an area that's relatively new for us, uh, trying to elucidate physical mechanisms of thermal transport in materials uh, and connecting those mechanisms to crystal chemistry. 
Uh, so when I first started poking around in this area, I discovered something that I guess I hadn't really appreciated before because I hadn't really worked on lead titanate, uh, and that's that it undergoes negative thermal expansion in its ferroelectric uh, tetragonal phase. Um, and so this is interesting, uh, to me at least, for a couple of different reasons. Uh, one is the volumetric uh, negative thermal expansion, uh, so where the whole uh, volume shrinks as the temperature uh, increases instead of, uh, yeah, no, where the whole volume shrinks, yes, when the temperature, sorry, it's been a long day. Um, uh, that's relatively rare. Uh, uniaxial negative thermal expansion uh, is more common. Um, and secondly, uh, negative thermal expansion among perovskites is even more rare. Uh, I'm happy to be corrected on this, but I believe that uh, lead titanate is the only known perovskite to undergo volumetric negative thermal expansion over any appreciable uh, temperature range. Uh, and so the first question that we wanted to ask was, well, uh, why does this happen? And what's the microscopic origin uh, of NTE in this material? Uh, and can we connect it to uh, bonding and crystal chemistry? Uh, so before I go too far into the details of, of what we did and what we found, I just wanted to spend a couple minutes talking about the very basic theory of uh, thermal expansion in insulators because uh, when I first started reading the literature in this area, I, I kind of found it very confusing. It was full of some very confusing terminology. So I want to try and be uh, very precise in how I talk about certain quantities uh, and how this problem is set up. Uh, so uh, alpha V is the coefficient of thermal expansion, uh, and that's negative in materials that undergo negative thermal expansion. Uh, so here this, uh, whoops. wrong way. Okay. So uh, here this uh, gamma G is the uh, thermodynamic uh, bulk Grunison parameter. I'll say more about that uh, in a minute. Um, and that's just multiplied by the specific heat uh, and that's at constant configuration. So for a given uh, unit cell configuration and in the denominator, uh, is just the bulk modulus at some temperature T uh, and the volume. So it's a relatively simple expression. Uh, the Grunison parameter, and there are actually um, a million different kinds of Grunison parameters because you can define them different ways. Um, they just tell you about how uh, phonon frequencies change with respect to some variable, uh, in this case uh, with pressure. So this is the, the mode Grunison parameter for mode S at wave vector Q. Uh, and then this uh, bulk Grunison parameter up here is just the sum of those individual mode Grunison parameters uh, across the Brillouin zone, uh, kind of weighted by their mode-specific heats. Uh, so uh, the mode Grunison parameters can be positive or negative, uh, but in order for a material to undergo uh, negative thermal expansion, this uh, bulk Grunison parameter up here has to be negative. Uh, because all of the other things in that expression have to be positive in a stable crystal. Okay, and, and then I just wanted to use the example uh, of silicon to show you how phonon frequencies can change with pressure uh, in order to give you positive or negative uh, Grunison parameters. So this is just the phonon dispersion curve uh, of silicon, diamond structured silicon from first principles calculations. Uh, and this is experimental data showing how uh, different sets uh, of phonons at two different wave vectors are changing with pressure. So the acoustic mode frequencies, uh, that's uh, these ones down here, and, and this is that branch, uh, those frequencies uh, decrease with uh, increasing pressure. And the optical mode uh, frequencies, so that's these guys up here and here, um, they increase with uh, increasing pressure. Okay, and then this is a kind of uh, Grunison dispersion curve. Uh, so it shows you how uh, the mode Grunison parameters are uh, changing as a function of uh, wave vector. Uh, and we can calculate these things uh, from first principles. Uh, but when we do that, it's usually with respect to volume and not pressure. Uh, so that's okay in a cubic material, the two definitions are uh, equivalent. It's not okay uh, in a non-cubic material. 
Uh, and so here again are the acoustic mode uh, frequencies, uh, and those guys uh, are negative. So their frequencies decrease with decreasing volume, uh, and the optical modes uh, are up here, uh, and they have positive uh, Grinizen parameters. Okay, so uh, so far so good. Uh, so if you sort of dive into the literature on negative thermal expansion, uh, you find that uh, there's this assumption that materials have to have negative Grinizen parameters uh, in order to undergo negative thermal expansion. And uh, the type of Grinizen parameter is, is not specified. Uh, what's measured is um, usually different from what's being calculated. Uh, and because um, the Grinizen parameters are defined with respect to how phonon frequencies are changing, uh, it kind of gives the impression that uh, it's only what the phonons are doing uh, that's important. Um, so there is sort of elastic property information inside the coefficient of thermal expansion, but it's the bulk modulus. It always has to be positive. So it can affect the magnitude of thermal expansion, um, but not its sign. Um, and this kind of comes from, uh, I think, uh, work on zirconium tungsten oxide, uh, which is kind of the canonical negative thermal expansion material. It undergoes NTE over a huge, huge temperature range, something like 1,000 Kelvin. Um, and so when this was discovered, it launched uh, a huge uh, research effort in this area. Um, the problem is that zirconium tungsten oxide uh, is cubic. Or it's not inherently a problem. Um, but if you uh, just sort of look at the, the standard expressions that people use in, in those papers, they're hiding some very important physics um, for non-cubic materials like ferroelectric uh, lead titanate. Uh, and you can see that if you uh, write the expression for the mode Grinizen parameter uh, in a slightly different way. Um, so here these uh, S's are elements uh, of the compliance tensor. Uh, and this gamma j is yet another kind of uh, Grinizen parameter. Uh, this time it's defined with respect to strain. Um, so this is exactly the same as this, just one's written in Voigt notation uh, and one isn't. So in the case uh, of a cubic material, things uh, reduce down in here um, so that uh, these compliance tensor elements uh, sort of go away. Uh, and gamma G uh, is exactly equal to gamma J. Uh, but that's not true in a non-cubic material. Okay, so these S's are still here. Um, and those S's can be positive or negative. Uh, and gamma J can be positive or negative. So overall, uh, if you look at the bulk uh, thermodynamic Grunizen parameter, it still needs to be uh, negative, but it can be negative uh, either because of uh, these compliance tensor elements um, or these uh, uh, Grunizen parameters. Um, and so the thing that we wanted to know was, well, what is this interplay? Is it mostly uh, the elastic uh, properties that are, that are involved in the thermal expansion? Is it mostly the vibrational? Um, is it some very delicate balance uh, between the two? Okay, so uh, the first was to uh, see if we could reproduce uh, the experimentally observed changes in the lattice parameter with temperature. Um, and so this is data from uh, two different experiments. Uh, so the C-axis uh, shrinks with temperature and the A-axis uh, expands. Uh, but the C-axis shrinks faster than the A-axis expands. And so overall, the volume uh, shrinks with temperature. Uh, and so can we, can we reproduce this, or at least qualitatively, with uh, density functional theory? Um, so there are two sources uh, of anharmonicity that drive uh, thermal expansion. It's an inherently uh, anharmonic effect. This is in insulators. So the phonon frequencies can change uh, because the lattice parameters change with temperature. Um, and they also change due to so-called intrinsic anharmonicity due to phonon-phonon. Uh, coupling. So number two uh, can be calculated uh, to low orders with a fair amount uh, of effort. Uh, number one can be treated uh, relatively straightforwardly uh, within uh, something called the quasi-harmonic approximation uh, with some caveats and limitations that I'm not going to get into. 
Um, so the idea here is to uh, minimize the Helmholtz free energy um, as a function of temperature and lattice parameters. And so the way you do this is to uh, build a grid of your lattice parameters, so A and C in the case of um, lead titanate. Uh, and then we want to uh, calculate these uh, different quantities uh, as a function of these lattice parameters uh, and minimize F. And what comes out uh, is a set of lattice parameters at each temperature T, and those are your equilibrium lattice parameters um, at those temperatures. So um, this is uh, just at 300 Kelvin, and then this minimum, where this minimum is as a function of A and C, uh, would move around uh, uh, as a function of temperature. Okay, so uh, this is now uh, showing data from uh, our calculations for uh, two different functionals, uh, and both of them do a reasonable job of uh, qualitatively sort of capturing the trend in the lattice parameters as, as a function of temperature. Uh, we chose to do uh, the rest of this work with the Wu Cohen functional um, just because it does a bit better job of capturing the structural trends. Not surprisingly, that's kind of what it was uh, designed for. Um, so, Ron, I don't know if you needed any, any more proof, but it works good. Okay, uh, so then we started uh, digging into the details once we had gone through uh, this sort of rigmarole of the quasi-harmonic approximation, uh, starting with looking at the, the vibrational uh, properties as represented by the Grunison parameters. So this is a phonon dispersion curve uh, of lead titanate, and the modes have been colored according to their uh, Grunison parameters. So uh, blue is negative, uh, red is positive, and this is the generalized Grunison parameter, so it's with respect to strain. Uh, and this is for strains along uh, the A-axis. Uh, and then at the side is a kind of uh, Grunison density of states. Uh, so you can see there are a lot of modes here uh, with uh, positive uh, mode Grunison parameters, so uh, a lot of uh, red modes. Uh, and then this is the uh, same, exactly the same idea, because uh, lead titanate is tetragonal in its ferroelectric phase, uh, the mode Grunison parameters are different along the C-axis than they are uh, along the A-axis. And so uh, this bottom uh, plot is for modes along the c-axis. Uh, and there's more uh, negative mode Grunison parameters this time, but, but still a lot of positive ones. Uh, and then we can uh, sum all of these up uh, across uh, the Brillouin zone in the relevant directions to get the uh, uh, bulk Grunison parameters. Uh, and they're positive along both directions. So if you were thinking that you need, uh, or you were expecting to see a negative uh, Grunison parameter along C, because C shrinks um, with temperature, then uh, this would be a little bit confusing. Uh, so we can see here if in these sort of Grunison density of states plots that there are uh, uh, lots of modes at low frequencies with uh, positive Grunison parameters. And so we just wanted to see you know, what role do those uh, low frequency modes play in the observed uh, behavior? Okay, so uh, this is uh, our data again, uh, but showing uh, volume except other than, rather than the two A and C uh, lattice parameters. And okay, it's going down with uh, temperature. Uh, and then we performed uh, a little experiment where uh, we asked, well, what would happen if we forced all modes with frequencies below 100 inverse centimeters to be perfectly harmonic. So in other words, we uh, forced their frequencies to stay uh, constant with temperature. Uh, and when we do that, uh, then we see that the negative thermal expansion behavior is, is completely suppressed, and we get positive thermal expansion instead. Uh, and you can do uh, the inverse experiment as well, where you only allow modes with frequencies above 100 inverse centimeters. Um, uh, you, have, you keep those perfectly harmonic, and you only allow the ones below 100 inverse centimeters to change with T. And then you still get negative thermal expansion, um, but with a reduced magnitude. So uh, those low frequency modes are very important. And then we just saw, well, what are these modes actually doing? So we looked at uh, the eigenvectors, 
and they correspond uh, mostly to translations of the lead atoms along uh, different crystallographic axes. Um, so if you're familiar with the, the NT literature, you may have heard of something called uh, RUMS or rigid unit modes. So these correspond to, um, in a perovskite, it would be sort of rigid rotations or tilts of the transition metal octahedra. Uh, and they can be very important uh, to NTE in, in some systems, but it doesn't look like they are in this particular system. Okay, so uh, that's the uh, vibrational part, but uh, there are still, there's still the elastic part to look at. So I've written uh, the coefficient of thermal expansion uh, along the c-axis here. I've written it out explicitly in terms of uh, specific compliance tensor elements uh, and the Grunison parameters. Uh, so there are four numbers here, uh, and uh, any of them can be positive or negative. Uh, although we already know that uh, the, the gammas are positive. Uh, and so here I'm just showing a schematic of what these compliance tensor elements uh, look like. Uh, so S13 is applying, uh, if you have a stress uh, along, this would be the A direction uh, in lead titanate. Then how does uh, the C uh, direction respond or how compliant is the C direction? Uh, and S33 is if you have uh, a stress along the C direction, uh, then how does uh, that same axis uh, respond? Okay, so uh, we can calculate uh, these things as well uh, from first principles, and, and we did that. So uh, when we calculate the value of S13, we find that it's uh, negative and reasonably large. Uh, so that means that when uh, the A-axis is expanding with temperature, uh, there's a reasonably strong uh, elastic coupling between A and C that's uh, pulling the C-axis down. So A really, really wants to expand, uh, and it's pulling the C-axis down for the ride. Uh, S33, in contrast, is uh, pretty big and positive. Uh, so the C-axis uh, is very compliant. And so we already know uh, what uh, the gammas are, and putting all of those things together, uh, alpha C ends up being uh, negative. So I haven't shown uh, the expression for alpha A because uh, alpha A is positive, A undergoes positive thermal expansion, and so it was really what alpha C is doing that determines whether we have uh, NTE or not. Uh, and so uh, the interpretation of this, uh, and I've kind of already hinted at it, um, it's not, not being driven by the axis that's actually uh, sort of shrinking with temperature. It's being driven by uh, the positive thermal expansion of the A axis. And then because there's this very strong elastic coupling between the A and C axes, C is just getting pulled down uh, uh, for the ride. Uh, and the net effect is volumetric uh, negative thermal expansion. Uh, but if this S13 gamma A product uh, had been positive, or even if it had been uh, slightly less, less negative, uh, then it would be energetically favorable for the C axis to expand with temperature instead. Um, so there is uh, a, a reasonably delicate balance here. Um, so you can see that balance by just kind of looking at this equation. You don't need to do any uh, fancy DFT calculations. Um, but what I think is neat is sort of seeing how the balance uh, manifests uh, in a real material. Okay, so we have the physical mechanism, but that's only half the story. Uh, and now we want to be able to connect that to uh, bonding and crystal chemistry. And I just wanted to... Um, that hasn't come out right. Um, so this is the work of uh, Helen Mego, um, a crystallographer, and she was sort of one of the first people uh, to look at thermal expansion in inorganic framework materials um, and try to connect physical mechanisms with crystal chemical uh, descriptors. And she mainly used uh, Pauling's ideas about uh, bonding and packing in uh, ionic crystals to do that. So what this plot is showing is uh, the thermal expansion coefficient for uh, a bunch of cubic materials uh, versus something called uh, the Pauling valence. And you know, there's a reasonable linear uh, correlation. Um, but uh, we have access to 
uh, many more sort of finer microscopic details um, uh, than Helen Megor had access to in her time. Um, so let's see what we can do with those. So we started this work uh, by comparing lead titanate to tin titanate. Uh, it's a very similar material, uh, but it undergoes uh, positive thermal expansion over the same temperature range that uh, lead titanate undergoes negative thermal expansion. Uh, and so the question, question was, well, why is that? Um, so the stuff that's on this slide uh, is probably already familiar uh, to people if you, if you uh, have worked on these sort of lone pair type compounds, but just um, in case you haven't, I wanted to give a brief uh, introduction. So both uh, lead 2 um, and, and tin are in the 2 plus oxidation state in these materials. So they have an S2P0 outer shell electron configuration. Uh, and those two uh, electrons in the outer shell uh, can be what chemists call uh, stereochemically active. So uh, at the top of the valence band, uh, there's an interaction between the lead or tin S uh, and the oxygen P states. Uh, and that interaction uh, is antibonding. And because those states are filled, uh, it's energetically destabilizing. Uh, the transition to the ferroelectric phase uh, lowers uh, the atomic site symmetries such that you can get some mixing in from uh, the uh, lead or tin P states uh, that sit at the bottom of the conduction band. Um, and that stabilizes uh, those states at the top of the valence band by forming a localized uh, non-bonding state uh, that chemists call a lone pair. Um, and so we did something called a, a crystal orbital Hamiltonian population analysis um, for both lead titanate and tin titanate in the cubic and tetragonal phases. All you need to know uh, for this table uh, is that uh, the sign represents a bonding or antibonding interaction and these numbers have units of energy. So uh, a negative sign is an antibonding interaction and a positive sign is a bonding interaction. So in lead titanate, when you go from uh, the cubic to the tetragonal phase, uh, that SOP interaction becomes slightly less antibonding. Uh, but in tin titanate, you go from being uh, bonding, sorry, antibonding in the cubic phase uh, to bonding in the tetragonal phase. So the tin 5S states are closer in energy to the oxygen P states than the lead 6S states are. Um, and so that interaction is stronger and you end up with a larger uh, structural distortion. Okay, so this is just uh, summarizing what I just said. In lead titanate, the C over A ratio is uh, closer to one. Uh, it's less tetragonal. Uh, in tin titanate, you have stronger hybridization. Uh, it's more tetragonal uh, and positive thermal expansion. So then which is more important uh, in the distorted phase? Is it the lone pair chemistry or the crystal structure? Mm -hmm. And so this little table shows uh, the relevant uh, elastic constants uh, and alpha C for both lead titanate and tin titanate. So for tin titanate, uh, we see that S13 is less negative. So there's less elastic coupling uh, between the A and C axes. S33 is uh, less positive, has a smaller magnitude, so the C-axis uh, is less compliant. Um, and the net effect of these things is an alpha C that's positive and positive volumetric uh, thermal expansion. Uh, these numbers are very different uh, because the Grunizen parameters of, of tin titanate that also go into the expression for alpha C, they're also different. Uh, and then we made a, a Frankenstein material. Uh, so this is tin titanate, but with a C over A ratio of lead titanate. Uh, so in this material, in this hypothetical material, uh, S13 is more negative. So there's more elastic coupling between uh, the A and C axes. Um, S33 is larger. It's closer to what it is in lead titanate. Uh, and together with the Grunizen parameters, uh, alpha C is, is negative, and so there's net negative thermal expansion. So the lone pair chemistry is important uh, for determining the size of the structural distortion away from the cubic phase. But once you're in the tetragonal phase, it's mainly the shape of the unit cell uh, that determines uh, the elastic properties and the Grunizen parameters. 
Um, okay, so uh, you can all uh, read my uh, summary. Uh, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, the incredibly hard work of my students. Uh, this was mostly uh, Ethan's work, and Sabrina has uh, also picked up uh, some of it and taken it in new directions. Uh, I also wanted to mention that um, I'm organizing uh, a workshop on phonons in advanced materials that might be of interest um, to people here. Uh, if I was a better ambassador, I would have um, made like a fancy slide with an advertisement, um, but I only thought of it like just before um, my talk. Um, but if you have any interest uh, in learning more about that, then please uh, come and find me during the break. Um, but other than that, thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, do we have any questions? So according to the picture, which uh, sounds very convincing, uh, if you were able to clamp the A and B lattice parameters of yep. the titanate, with polarization out of plane. Yeah. And uh, that material would not have a negative thermal expansion. So we actually did that. Uh, we looked at um, NTE as a function of uh, strain, like biaxial strain. Um, and there are uh, some strains for which um, th that's right, where the th negative thermal expansion is suppressed. Um, and it's because of a mismatch between the rate of thermal expansion of the substrate and the film. But then I may, maybe I misunderstood something. You said, okay, A and B want, want to grow. Yeah. And by growing, they also, they diminish the C. Yeah. So the net effect, but if A and B are not allowed to grow at all, then they would not diminish Yes, C, yes, right? that's so right. So if we, f yes, so if we force uh, A to to be where it is, then C really wants to expand. Uh, maybe a very naive question. Should this also reflect somehow in Poisson ratios? The yeah. Yes, so that, that is S13 is, is kind of showing the Poisson-like coupling between A and C. So is it large? Because in perovskites, people generally assume it to be about 0.3. So what is it in lead titanate? Is it much larger than 0.3? I think, isn't the Poisson ratio only technically defined for cubic materials? Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, we didn't calculate the the Poisson, the Poisson ratio uh, exactly, okay. but um, that S13 is showing you that Poisson-like coupling. Okay, thank you. All right, let's have our next speaker set up, and let's see if there's one more question. I just uh, wonder, so this... Um, Formulation of the community uh, taken from the literature that the rooms, ramp modes are very important. It's because they didn't probably thought about lead titanate. So it, it's nice. I like your example showing that you have counterexample, breaking the wisdom of the community. But maybe could you formulate it also in more positive way? Could you know which are mother materials like lead titanate? I guess the most important aspect here is there is a strong ordered parameter, it's ordered phase. You are not cubic, you have this polarization coupled to the strain. But can you somehow generalize it? Can you guess a new material? I think um, one of the conclusions from this work was, um, I mean, just based on the rums, to me one of the conclusions was how difficult it was or it is to come up with one descriptor because uh, in a non-cubic material, there's the elastic properties and the vibrational properties that you have to worry about. And the balance between them uh, is pretty delicate. Uh, and so you can't just say, um, oh, look at the elastic properties or look at the Grunison parameters. Uh, it's really both of those things together that are gonna determine the sign of thermal expansion. So, um, 
I've, I would love to, to look in, to, to say, yes, this is the one thing that you should look for. Um, but I think one of the lessons of this work, at least for me, was that it's not just one thing. Let's thank Nicole one more time. Our next presenter is Alexei Bokov, and he'll be talking about giant piezoelectricity and perovskite ceramics at high temperatures. Thank you for the introduction. Okay. Now it's better, right? I will be talking about design of piezoelectric materials for high temperature applications. As you know, during the last several years, there was a very impressive achievements in the, um, among the piezoelectric materials. The piezoelectric properties increased greatly and Mostly it is related to the invest in, mm, invention of relaxer-based single crystals. But uh, what is wrong with these crystals? What is not good? First, they are crystals. That's, they're expensive, hard to prepare. And the same compositions in ceramic states usually have much lower piezoelectric properties. The other problem is that they work at low temperatures because Curie temperature is comparatively low. And what is more important, uh, they have morphotropic phase boundary and uh, the phase transition between two phases at, l at temperature lower than Curie temperature. And of course, if you have phase transition, uh, the main structure changes and it is impossible to heat the crystal above this depolarization temperature. And one more problem is that the KRC field is comparatively low, two, three kilovolt per centimeter typically, uh, which makes the material not very stable, especially at elevated temperatures. But high temperature materials are needed. And here uh, we show the review of existing uh, materials, which piezoelectric materials, ceramics, which can work at high temperatures. And you can see that the higher the, okay. Uh. Okay, you can see that the higher the temperature, the lower uh, the working temperature, the lower the piezoelectric coefficient. Uh, I'd like to report the development of new morphotropic phase boundary ceramics, which has very large D33, effective D33 coefficients, 2,500, and it is observed at 200 Celsius, and you can see that this is much larger than the in existing materials. Uh, it is the composition based on the known solid solutions, uh, which is what is new is the addition of lead tin niobate, several percent, but this several percent make difference. First, I report the properties, and then I try to explain the mechanisms under the behind this behavior. Uh, you can see that X-ray diffraction shows the morphotropic phase boundary uh, when uh, uh, concentration of lead changes. We observe the transition from at room temperature from rhombohedral to tetragonal phase. Uh, and temperature dependence of permittivity shows the Curie temperature about 400 say, Celsius. This is comparatively high. And at lower temperature, you can see uh, this anomaly, which is associated with the phase transition between rhombohedral and tetragonal phases. 
this is a transition related to morphotropic phase boundary. This means that the boundary is inclined in the phase diagram, and upon heating, we um, can obtain the phase transition. And these are the properties at room temperature. You can see in, in, in increase of uh, spontaneous of Raman polarization as expected at morphotropic phase boundary and quite high KFC field. Uh, this is about order of magnitude larger than in uh, relaxer-based crystals. Then, if we measure small signal piezoelectric coefficient, we again see the maximum of this coefficient and electromechanical coupling factor at morphotropic base phase boundary, and the value is about almost 600. Uh, this, is, this is high value, but you can say that it is not very high. Some ceramics have larger values, but you need to remember that we're, uh, in that ceramics, the curie temperature is low. We are talking about the materials with high curie temperature. And if we measure uh, the strain under unipolar electric field, we observe almost linear dependence of strain on electric field with small, comparatively small hysteresis. Uh, this means that effective piezoelectric coefficient, which is measured as the relation between strain divided by field is about the same as small signal coefficient, a little bit higher and depends on, little bit depend on, depends on field. And, but now if we compare different, um, different ceramics designed for high temperature applications with high curie temperature, we can see that our ceramics is the best one. D33 is higher than for the existing ones, and uh, effective D33 is much higher. This is good, but this is not the whole story. It is not enough to have high Curie temperature. Mm, it is, we need to be sure that the material can still work at high temperatures. Thus, here, uh, the dependence of properties, piezoelectric properties, on the temperature at which the material was heated is shown. Thus, the material was heated up to these temperatures, then cooled down, and properties are measured. And we can see that it is quite stable up to 250, 350 uh, Celsius, we observe no change of properties. Uh, thus, this is good material for applications. For some materials, uh, the properties change at lower temperatures. Uh, this is because of morphotropic phase boundary. And uh, at the materials with higher, most high uh, piezoelectric coefficient, 600, we observe nothing changes up to 250. Celsius. Thus, this material is good for high temperature applications. But uh, what is more interesting is the properties, high, high temperature properties. These properties were measured directly at high temperature. And this is the dependence of strain on electric field at different temperature, unipolar uh, field. And we can see that. Uh, effective piezoelectric coefficient, which is measured at different fields, can be as high as 2,500 at temperature as high as 250 Celsius. And if we compare with the existing materials, it is much higher than before. Uh, and the KRC field at this temperature is still high. We cannot measure it because we cannot obtain 
saturated uh, hysteresis loops, but it is much, but it is larger than five kilovolt per centimeter. This is good result for materials. And we can see uh, that the properties are intrinsic. Thus, this is uh, by the response force microscopy pictures measured directly at high temperatures for the uh, MPB composition. And we can see that amplitude of piezoelectric response uh, is increased at high temperature, 160 Celsius as compared to low temperature. While the domain structure is not, doesn't change noticeably. How we can explain this? We use the standard landau jamesburg uh theory Gibbs free energy is expanded as a function of polarization. And um, from the literature, we can estimate the coefficients. We took the same coefficients as for PZT ceramics, because we don't know exactly uh, from our material. And this are co these coefficients were, were the same, and to obtain the, compare, uh, the agreement with the, our experiment, we need to change a little bit these two coefficients. And after that, uh, taking the temperature dependence of coefficient uh, before quadratic term, and with known Curie temperature and Curie constant, we obtain such kind of shape for uh, potential energy at room temperature, we have the energy minimum uh, in the in one, one, one direction, which corresponds rhombohedral symmetry as, as we measured by x-ray. And red ball shows the um, stable phase. Metastable phase is tetragonal, energy is a little bit higher and unstable phase cross uh, shows uh, the position of orthorhombic phase. And here the profiles of the potential in 111 in 001 direction, tetragonal phase and metastable tetragonal phase and stable rhombohedral phase. What happens when we heat the material up to two 100 Celsius. You can see that the energy of the triangle phase becomes lower as comparison of rhombohedral, and we have very small energy barrier between these two phases. And when we look at the these profiles, we, we can see that uh, the barrier is small, and if we apply electric field along 001 direction, uh, we can expect uh, the field-induced phase transition from rhombohedral to tetragonal symmetry. And this phase transition is associated with the large, uh, not only with the change of angle of spontaneous polarization. When we have change of angle, we have associated strain, uh, this is field in, uh, known as field-induced rotation of spontaneous polarization. But also, we have field-induced extension of spontaneous polarization because the spontaneous polarization in the tetragonal phase is much larger, and associated strain, strain gives rise to very large piezoelectric effect. And when we remove field, the system goes back and the energy barrier is small and accordingly the hysteresis is small. And then when we look at uh, the picture at 350 Celsius, uh, only the tunnel phase is stable and uh, the, par uh, the properties are much lower, but it is very high temperature, close to Curie temperature. And thus, we, our properties are because of field-induced 
transition from rhombohedral to tetragonal phase. Generally, this is known effect, and some papers were published quite long ago. This is the result for uh, relaxer-based relaxer single crystals. Uh, we can see, again, here rhombohedral phase, here, the transition from rhombohedral to tetragonal phase, and then tetragonal phase. Uh, strain is large, but the problem is that it is highly nonlinear. That's it. It's not good for applications. Why we have linear or approximately linear relation in ceramics? It is because uh, the field, uh, the direction of field with respect to telegraphic directions, are different and different ceramic grains, and the, this transition is uh, become diffused in terms of energy, in terms of electric field. Thus, usually we know that properties of crystals are better than the properties of ceramics, but this is the rare example where ceramics works better uh, than crystals. We have linear dependence. Thus, these are the brief review the brief conclusions, and thank you for your attention. All right, any questions? So sorry if you, if you said this, but are these polled, these samples? Are, are they polled before yes. you measure it? Okay, so is there any dependence on the direction of polling? No dependence or direction of pulling. This is ceramics. Right, right. That's right. all directions are the same. Okay, okay, okay. So there, you you know that they're random grain orientations. Yes, we have uh, the picture of uh, um, electron microscopy. It looks like usual ceramics. A comment that might be relevant to understand the huge number that you get. Uh, a long time ago, we ran some simulations, first principles of uh, bismuth scandate, lead titanate uh, solid solutions, and we realized that bismuth scandate, if you solve it in the computer in the, in the tetragonal phase of lead titanate, is super tetragonal. So bismuth scandate has a C over A of 1.3 or something like that. So I was wondering whether the, what you are calling tetragonal phase uh, could actually be a super tetragonal phase, and so which gives you this huge strain, and therefore this uh, very, very big value. Sorry. Uh, yes, I suspect that what you have... I'm going to give you a microphone because reverberation. Okay. Ah, okay. Ah, so the microphone doesn't <laughs> So I, I suspect that what you have as the tetragonal phase is a super tetragonal phase. Because this would scan scanned it by itself, of course. You cannot synthesize it, but if you solve it in the computer with the usual lead titan structure, it happens to be super tetragonal with a C over of 1.3. So probably. 40% yeah. bismuth scandate is super tetragonal. Yes, that's probably. Because otherwise, what you have would be what you would have in PCT when you go from rhombohedral to the tetragonal first to the tetragonal to the blunder. And there, the number is not so large, right? Yes, yes. And it, it, could, it could be absorbed in different, different solid solutions. That's no, but here you go to super tetragonal, and that's, that's your need. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. So I believe an Indian group has reported uh, about 1,500 picometer per volt in, in bismuth ferrite doped with lanthanum and lead titanate ceramics in about 2015. It's in nature materials. And then they see uh, a kind of, a, I think, a disordered phase, uh, disordered with some nanoscopic dom uh, at a nanoscopic uh, level. Uh, and then, which doesn't change much with the uh, application of electric field. Uh, so it's, it's a different uh, explanation than MPB-related phase transition for uh, how they get this high piezoelectric uh, response. And you mean it's on ceramics. By the post-force microscopy data, right? Sorry? You, you mean by, uh, by the response force microscopy data, or? No, 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 it's, it's just... Uh, I think neutron diffraction and electron microscopy. So they report this uh, intermediate phase, which 
uh, which acts as a bridge between moving from one polarization to a rhomboidal polarization, which eases it rather rather than an MPP kind of a formulation. Maybe I can uh, we can discuss later. The, it's it's a Nature Materials paper, so. You see, of course, uh, the intermediate phase can uh, can exist, but we can explain everything without any intermediate phase. Okay, but structurally, they see that to exist, so. Probably, yeah. All right, let's thank our speaker one more time. <laughs> and everybody in this session. Okay, I want to th thank you. I want to thank all the speakers today and everybody. Uh, and uh, the bar is open and the posters are up. And uh, so everybody should uh, be able to relax and uh, talk with people at their posters. It's an important part of the meeting, too. And I think uh, there's enough refreshments out there uh, to uh, allow you to put off dinner a little bit. Okay, so uh, we'll, we'll start on time tomorrow morning, and hopefully, uh, 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 God willing, smoothly. Okay, so thank you. Oh, one last thing. So the room will not be locked, but they tell me the building is locked, and so everything should be safe, but there's no, like, uh, insurance, okay? So if you leave something here, it's your responsibility, but it should be safe. Okay.